Um, <clears throat> During this declared state of emergency, the meeting will be conducted in accordance with California Government Code 54953E as authorized by the resolution of the City Council. Please contact the clerk at city.clerk at mountainview.gov to obtain a copy of the applicable resolution. All members of the EPC are participating in this meeting via video conference with no physical meeting location. Members of the public wishing to observe the meeting live may do so at mountainview.legistar.com on YouTube at mountainview.gov slash YouTube and on Comcast at channel 26. As noted in the meeting agenda, members of the public may provide oral comment during the public comment sections of a particular item by joining the Zoom webinar at the webinar ID of 853-0070-5240. Emails and voicemail messages received before 5 p.m. today were forwarded to the EPC. All votes will be taken by roll call vote and I'll ask the APC clerk to take the roll. Ms. Benamar. Okay. Commissioner Clark. Uh, here. Commissioner Dempsey. Here. Commissioner Gutierrez. Here. Commissioner Haymeyer. Here. Commissioner Jimenez. Here. <clears throat> Vice Chair Yin. Here. And Chair Sampson. Here. So the first, the next item in the agenda is oral, oral communications. This portion of the meeting uh, is reserved for persons wishing to address the EPC on matters that are not on the agenda. Speakers will be allowed to speak on any topic for up to three minutes during the section. State law prohibits the commission from acting on any non-agenda item. Would any member of the public on the line like to provide comment on a non-agenda item? If so, please click the raise hand button in Zoom or press star nine on your phone. Phone users can mute and unmute themselves with star six. You can see clerk will start the timer and let you know when your time is up. Do you have anyone wishing to speak? I'm seeing no hands. Doesn't look like anyone. All right, I'll, I'll figure out why Zoom, why I can't find my screens on Zoom here in a minute. Um, so the main item on our agenda tonight is a public hearing for the Middlefield Park Master Plan. Star Web, do any commissioners wish to? Have any make any disclosures regarding contact with the applicant or visits to the site? Commissioner Hamer. We've done both. I've met with the applicant virtually and visited the site. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Dempsey. Met with the applicant virtually and visited the site. Thank you. Vice Chair Yin. Um, I did the very same as the other two commissioners. Commissioner yeah. Gutierrez. Yes, I just visited the site. I make a policy not to speak with anyone in general. Uh, Commissioner Clark. I uh, visited the site and met with the applicant virtually. Commissioner Nunez. Um, the applicants requested a meeting with me and I accepted and I've been there many times just by virtue of living in the city. And. Um... I had a meeting with the applicant and I visited the site as well. So we will begin with a presentation by Lindsay Hagen, Assistant Community Development Director. Um, Lindsay, you're on. All right, I will go ahead and share my screen. All right, uh, good evening, Chair Cranston and Vice Chair Yin and Commissioners. Uh, I'm here tonight to present to you the Middlefield Park Master Plan. Um, I do want to note that I will be discussing uh, various sort of major components of this project and key highlights, but I will not be talking about every single component of this project in this presentation. But of course, I'm happy to talk through anything further tonight with the EPC. In September 2020, uh, the applicant uh, Google, in partnership with Lendlease, submitted an application for this Middlefield Park Master Plan to the city. The master plan is located 
in the East Woodsman Precise Plan. It's approximately 40 acres in size across 14 existing parcels located on the eastern edge of the city. Uh, the map on your screen here shows the boundaries in yellow of the master plan. It's generally bounded by Ellis Street on the west side, Middlefield Road and Maud Avenue on the south, the city limit boundary on the east, and the city and county of San Francisco SFPUC property to the north. Um, the site is located within a half mile of the VTA Middlefield Light, Ra Light Rail Station, which is shown here in orange. Um, the site is also located in the Middlefield Ellis Wisman Superfund area, as well as uh, a contaminated ground plume. Um, and lastly, the site is in close proximity to the Moffett Airfield, so there are height and land use restrictions for which this master plan is consistent with those. Um, this project's gone through a series of community meetings. Um, there are public meetings with EPC and council study sessions early last year. Uh, there's been multiple meetings with the Development Review Committee um, on some of the design aspects of the master plan, as well as a series of community meetings uh, to gather input. What's not shown on here are the numerous meetings that the applicant has held with various interested stakeholders, neighborhood groups, and other interested parties. Um, in terms of the master plan itself, uh, the applicant is proposing a, sort of a maximum development program that includes up to 1,900 high-density residential uh, units, which are shown here in orange in seven locations labeled R on the graphic on your screen. Um, they're proposing 2.4 acres of land dedication for affordable housing to the city. Approximately 1.3 million square feet of office and R&D is proposed, shown in blue in five locations labeled O on your screen. About 50,000 square feet of ground floor commercial uh, that is labeled active use and shown in red on your screen in five of the residential locations, Ellis Park, as well as the P2 parking structure. And approximately 10 acres of parks and open space are proposed with just under seven acres uh, of land proposed to be dedicated to the city for public parks. Um, these are labeled Gateway Park on the south side, a bridge open space on the north side and Bob Park in the center. Um, in addition to those three public parks, uh, the applicant is also proposing a 2.8 acre privately owned publicly accessible called Copa's uh, open space labeled Ellis Park shown adjacent to the VTA tracks. In addition to these, there are also two district parking structures uh, labeled with a P and shown in gray on the screen, which are really proposed to serve the majority of parking for the office buildings. And otherwise, uh, each office location is proposed to have some parking on site, and every residential and mixed use building is proposed to have parking on site. Um, in addition to these various land uses, there are six private service streets proposed to be constructed to provide access from the public streets to uh, the associated buildings. In addition to pedestrian and bicycle um, connections and pathways throughout the project area. Uh, finally, the applicant's proposing an optional design feature to incorporate a private district utility system that could include uh, a central utility plant in the 01 location, uh, which could serve the entire master plan area uh, with water, wastewater, recycled water, thermal energy, and electricity. Um, this optional feature is at the applicant's discretion to pursue. Uh, the master plan is located in the East Woods and Mixed Use and High Intensity Office uh, land use designation of the general plan shown here on the left. The master plan is consistent with these land use designations and the East Woods and Change area of the general plan. Uh, within the East Wisdom Precise Plan, shown on the right-hand side here, the master plan spans three different character sub-areas, the high-intensity um, character area, the mixed-use, or sorry, medium-intensity character area, and uh, the low-intensity employment character area. Uh, the master plan is consistent with the Precise Plan, with the exception of the two development standards uh, that were discussed in the staff report related to the additional key corner and office building uh, facade links, which are both included in the master plan uh, to be considered and evaluated with future building permits and building designs. Um, the applicants proposing to implement the master plan in four development phases, um, which are ultimately at the discretion of the applicant to build, but the project must always maintain minimum compliance with the precise plan, the master plan, and ultimately city requirements. 
Um, so in some cases, as mentioned in the staff report, uh, interim measures will be required to provide that uh, minimum compliance at each phase. So um, looking at the uh, phasing of this project in a little bit more detail, phase one includes the market rate residential units at R1 and R2, constructing a portion of the Ellis Popa open space adjacent to those two locations, um, dedicating the 2.4 acres of land for affordable housing at R4A and R6, dedicating the land for a half acre gateway park, um, and then also implementing and constructing um, modifications to the VTA bus duck out that is along Middlefield Road today to accommodate a new mid-block crossing across Middlefield Road, as well as other sidewalk and roadway improvements on Middlefield Road. Phase two uh, proposes the office to build the office locations at 01 and 02 um, to dedicate the 1.3 acre bridge open space area, which is comprised of two different parcels on either side of the VTA tracks. Uh, the intended purpose of this land is to accommodate a future city design and constructed head bike bridge, uh, which is identified in the East Wisdom Precise Plan. Um, additionally, the applicant would be responsible to install new uh, traffic signals on Ellis to accommodate a new private service street between O1 and R2, um, as well as new mid-block crossings on Ellis. Uh, and lastly, um, new sidewalk and bike lane improvements along Ellis Street as well. For phase three, uh, the applicant is proposing to construct the market rate residential units at R3, R4B, and R5, um, as well as dedicate over five acres of land for Mod Park, um, construct new mid-block crossings, uh, or sorry, a, a new mid-block crossing on Logue Avenue, connecting the bridge open space to Mod Park. Additionally, um, today there's a cul-de-sac on Logue Avenue. That cul-de-sac needs to be reconstructed and shifted all the way to the northernmost part of the project site. And so that reconstruction would be part of this phase. Additionally, uh, new sidewalks and bike lane improvements on Mod and Logue Avenue. Uh, one thing I do wanna point out is that the precise plan envisions um, removing street parking along one side of the street for Logue Avenue, Mod Avenue, and Clyde Avenue in order to accommodate a buffered on-street bike lanes on both sides. Um, so this project would be implementing that uh, street configuration on all three street frontages along the project. For phase four, this is the last phase, office locations 03, 04, 05 would be constructed as well as the district parking structures, P1 and P2, uh, as well as two new mid-block crossings to provide direct access to those parking structures and sidewalk and bike lane improvements on Clyde Avenue. So why is Google Lindley submitting a master plan uh, within this precise plan area? Um, the list on your screen here are really all the reasons that are required in the precise plan for a master plan. Um, I won't be going over all of them, but I do wanna highlight a couple of them. Number one, uh, for any development in the North, or sorry, neighborhood park master plan area, which is shown in pink on the graphic, um, this area for any development to occur requires a master plan in order to accommodate and plan for a future public park. Um, and the applicant has done that in this case. Uh, number two for street C, which is also shown on here, street C is a public street that the East Wisdom Precise Plan identified. Um, it gave the option for a developer to, um, instead of providing street C, uh, if, if it's not needed for access or utilities, uh, that they could alternatively provide multimodal access through the area. And so Google is requesting not to install Street C and instead has pro proposed and provided multimodal access. And lastly, uh, item number three on here related to uh, the location of parks. Um, the linear park identified in the precise plan, which is shown here as that bold green line along the northern part of the master plan area. Um, in investigating that area further, the city and applicant determined that shifting that space south uh, to actually increase the size of Mod Park and the bridge open space was a more appropriate uh, design configuration for that open space, uh, mostly because there's extensive underground utilities in that location that it's currently shown at, uh, which would not allow for many improvements. Um, and so that modification has been included in the master plan um, so ultimately the master plan does satisfy all these requirements um, 
per the precise plan. So getting into the residential development, the applicant is proposing to construct uh, up to 1,520 market rate units. Uh, they're pursuing rental units initially, um, but they are pro proposing and providing the flexibility by um, incorporating, incorporating condo maps to potentially have ownership units as well in the future. Um, as part of this development proposal, they are proposing just under 400,000 square feet of bonus residential FAR. Uh, which requires them to contribute approximately $2.1 million of community benefits and also requires other green building measures. Um, the table you see on the screen here is the number of units estimated at each residential location, uh, which is about 38% of the residential units planned for the mixed use um, character area of the precise plan. And this translates to about 4,000 residents that could be housed here. In addition to the residential market rate housing, um, the city has a below market rate housing requirement, uh, which includes the 15% inclusionary affordable units to be provided within the market rate development. Uh, additionally, the city has uh, the non-residential housing impact fee based on commercial development. Um, and those fees, of course, go towards funding affordable housing. So this project's affordable housing obligations um, include uh, paying a housing impact fee for the commercial component of the of the development proposed at about 19.3 million. In lieu of providing inclusionary units, the applicants pursuing a BMR alternative mitigation uh, based on the city's BMR regulations, uh, which is an option that they can pursue. So ultimately the city requires an alternative mitigation to exceed the inclusionary requirement and advance other city housing goals and objectives around affordable housing. Um, and it's at the discretion of the council to approve it. Um, the applicant's BMR alternative mitigation proposal includes dedicating 2.4 acres of land on two parcels, R4A and R6, shown here in black, um, delivering those parcels as part of the phase one building permits. Um, and this would put at least one of the sites, R4A, about four years earlier than what would be required. So with this alternative mitigation, um, the city hired a consultant team, strategic economics and Insightful Consulting to help us evaluate the proposal. Um, we worked on identifying quantitative and qualitative criteria to evaluate this, uh, confirm compliance with the land dedication requirements, um, look at the development potential of these sites, as well as the funding needs to deliver the units, um, and really tried to base this on local Mountain View trends um, as well as based on outreach to affordable housing developers. So some of the key results from the evaluation are shown here on your screen. Um, some of the main points I wanna make uh, is that there is sufficient land to accommodate more than 15% affordable units, uh, which is a key component uh, of compliance. Um, and that this approach does require significant external funding and local city funding likely. Um, that wouldn't exist with an inclusionary requirement. So overall, the evaluation concluded that the proposal does comply with the alternative mitigation requirements and does offer a proposal that is greater than the on-site inclusionary units. In addition to the residential components of the project, the applicant is building about 50% net new office area. Uh, this means they're requesting about 630,000 uh, square feet from the precise plan development reserve for the new office. Um, the master plan includes about 622,000 square feet of bonus non-residential FAR, which requires community benefit contribution of about 16.9 million. Um, as part of the bonus FAR, the project's required to be LEED Platinum and incorporate other sustainability requirements. And lastly, the project's required to uh, comply with the job housing linkage program, um, which really is intended to coordinate office and residential development as a strategy to ensure office doesn't outpace housing development in the area. Um, and this project is compliant with that jobs housing linkage program. In terms of active uses on the site, the project's required to provide a minimum of 5,000 square feet um, at Ellis Middlefield um, per the precise plan intended to accommodate neighborhood commercial uses. And so this 50,000 square feet proposed by the applicant includes that 5,000. Um, the active uses are really uh, neighborhood commercial uses as defined in the precise plan, uh, things like retail services, restaurants, and civic and community spaces. And a good portion of this um, area is 
proposed to be participating in the applicant's community um, benefit program geared towards small businesses. So getting into the community benefits, um, Google Lend Lease is required to provide 19.1 million of community benefits. In lieu of paying the community benefit in fee, they are proposing to fulfill the obligation in two ways. One is a cash payment within 90 days of approval of half a million dollars. And these are being referred to as people-centric funds. Um, they're intended to serve programs and needs at the discretion of council um, related to the items you see listed here in this red box on your screen. Additionally, they are proposing a small business diversification and nonprofit inclusion program um, or a small business pro program, which they're valuing at 18.6 million. Um, this program is made up of a couple different components, including constructing 21,000 square feet of subsidized ground floor commercial space in R1 and R2, um, providing capped rents for those spaces, as well as a tenant improvement allowance to build out the space. They're also proposing to construct a thousand square foot community pavilion building in Ellis Park Popa um, that will have minimal rents and available to the community for its use. Um, and then they're also providing uh, about a $3 million um, support fund to assist small businesses participating in this program uh, with additional funding needs and services to support their growth and development in the area. And this program is really targeted to serving businesses owned by women and people from underserved backgrounds, a grocer, nonprofits, and businesses with 50% or more of employees who are women and people from underserved backgrounds. Since a good portion of this community benefit proposal is based on subsidized constructed space, uh, the city had strategic economics review the value assumptions that Google had as part of this program. And while strategic and economics and Google's numbers didn't perfectly match, um, it did show that with the cash payment, um, as well as considering all carrying costs that the, that the developer will have for the subsidized space, including all impact fees required. Um, the value of the entire community benefit proposal is more like 19.2 to 19.6 million. And that variation is really just based on any ground floor commercial that might be exempt from certain impact fees. Um, and so in the end, the community benefit program is compliant. Um, another thing just briefly worth mentioning is because it's uh, a lot of this program is, is concentrated in R1 and R2, which is part of phase one, it does mean that the applicant is advanced delivering much of the community benefits as part of phase one. Moving on to public access, um, this graphic on your show on your screen shows various forms and areas of public access on private property. Um, the red arrow represents 24 seven multimodal public access through the project area for bikes and peds, um, which aligns with the multi use pathways and the private service streets throughout the project area. These are all required connections in the precise plan. I will note there is only one that's an additional connection that is not in the precise plan, which is uh, the pathway shown on the south side of P2. Um, the purple area, which is sort of hard to see here, um, it encompasses the entire Ellis Park Popa area along the VTA light rail tracks. And this is required to be publicly accessible for recreational use during city park hours. Um, as part of the requirement for obtaining a parkland credit. The yellow dashed area represents the area within Ellis Popa that is proposed to have extended hours um, past city park hours to accommodate access to businesses along R1 and R2, as well as access to the VTA station. Aside from the three public parks and open spaces that are proposed to be dedicated to the city and would be designed and constructed, by the city in accordance with our standard public park design process, Google's proposing this Ella Park Popa open space. Um, this space will be designed, constructed, and maintained by Google Lendlease. Um, and in doing so, the applicant's requesting a parkland credit of up to 75% of this 2.8 acre area to count towards their parkland obligations. The applicant has provided a conceptual design shown here. Uh, which includes a series of recreational elements, things like playgrounds, sports court, um, and an educational demonstration garden. Um, ultimately, the final design of this space would come with subsequent permits submitted with the city to the city that include detailed site and building designs. So staff has reviewed the proposal and finds it is compliant with the city's requirements. Another component of this project is the 20 year development agreement the applicant has requested to build out their project beyond the standard two year entitlement period. 
Um, as part of the development agreement, the applicant has offered the following public benefits to the city and its residents, including offerings worth about $11 million, which was previously presented at the EPC and council study sessions. Um, albeit they were slightly adjusted in the distribution of, of these three items, but they are the same. Uh, this includes a cash payment of $1 million for people-centric funds to be paid at uh, the building permit of the first office building to fund and install public art in Ellis Popa open space valued at a million dollars and a cash payment of $9 million to facilitate the design construction of Mod Park, uh, Parks Recreational Amenities. In addition to these features during the review of the project, city and applicant agreed upon additional public benefits, including funding and preparing a quarter million dollar study for the bridge open space, um, sharing 40 parking spaces within the project for Mod Park visitors, allowing city use of the Ellis Plaza and community pavilion building within Ellis Park multiple times a year at no rent, and the applicant making good faith efforts to obtain a use tax permit, a uh, point of sale permit um, at the project site to allow the city to get a larger portion of sales use tax generated from the construction of the project. Um, procedurally, an important thing to understand about the master plan is how it relates to future permits. Um, the applicant is required to obtain permits uh, from the city for each phase of development to actually construct development. Um, based on the feedback from the council study session in 2021, uh, the master plan is proposed to utilize the streamlined um, review process outlined in the precise plan, which allows future permits consistent with the master plan to be approved at an administrative zoning public hearing in lieu of a city council public hearing. So looking at the graphic on your screen, if the master plan is approved, the applicant would be required to submit uh, a zoning permit for each development phase. That permit would go through the typical development review process with city staff reviewing for compliance. Uh, there would be a public community meeting. Uh, the project would be reviewed by the development review committee and finally, the zoning administrator would make a final decision on the permit at a public hearing. Um, the ZA does always have the ability to refer a permit to city council when needed, which really would be in cases where there are inconsistencies or major modifications proposed. Um, as requested at the prior study session, staff defined minor and major modifications to the master plan um, to make it clear what the review structure and authority would be. Um, so minor modifications are really exceptions allowed in the precise plan or identified in the master plan or allowed by plan community permit. Um, these can all be reviewed by the zoning administrator at a public hearing. And major modifications are those that fundamentally change the project. So things like increasing the heights beyond what's been approved in the master plan, um, locating the land dedications in different locations than what has been shown. Um, and so these would all require going back to council for approval and authorization. The last development component is related to the vesting tentative map that's being requested. Um, as shown on your screen, the applicant's proposing to create 18 new parcels, um, up to 1,900 residential condo units or lots, and 140 vertical subdivision lots for commercial use and the private uh, district system. Uh, with this project, the city prepared a supplemental environmental impact report, which cheered off the East Wisdom Precise Plan EIR and the General Plan EIR. Um, a supplemental EIR is prepared when, um, to address one or more new significant effects not previously discussed in a prior EIR. For this project, that includes air quality. Uh, the Precise Plan EIR is a program level EIR that BACMED has separate threshold standards for compared to a development project. So the precise plan EIR noted that future development projects would need to evaluate their air quality impacts based on BACMET's project level thresholds. So the master plan has been analyzed at the project level BACMET thresholds and result in impacts. Um, aside from air quality, all, all other environmental impacts were adequately covered in the prior EIRs. Um, from this project, uh, the significant air quality impacts are directly tied to the scale of this project, the overlapping construction and operational periods over eight and a half years, um, and the proximity of the approved yet to be constructed 400 Logue Avenue residential project. So with these significant unavoidable air quality impacts, um, in order to certify the EIR, the city does have to adopt statement of overriding considerations. Uh, which note the project benefits outweigh the environmental impacts identified, which was included in exhibit one to this to the staff report. I do briefly want to describe a little more detail about the significant unavoidable air quality impacts. 
So air pollutants are regulated at the federal and state level. One of the main ones is the ozone, um, which is really comprised of reactive organic gases, or ROG, uh, nitrogen oxides, or NOx, and ultraviolet light. Um, sources of ROG and NOx include emissions from project construction and operations, so things like construction equipment, uh, mobile vehicles, generators, paint, and consumer products all contribute to that. Um, BACMED has project level thresholds for ROG and NOx, um, and if a project exceeds those, it's considered an impact. Um, specifically, this project's operational emissions exceed BACMED's thresholds for ROGs, with the greatest emissions coming from architectural coatings and consumer products and mobile vehicle emissions. Um, a health risk assessment was conducted for outdoor air impacts at sensitive receptors within 1,000 feet, and it concluded that 400 Logue Avenue could have impacted sensitive receptors. Um, finally, the project has mitigated to the greatest extent feasible to address these air quality impacts, but the impacts cannot be addressed to a less than significant level, um, hence why it's a significant unavoidable impact. In terms of next steps, an administrative zoning public hearing is scheduled for October 26 um, to review and provide recommendation to council on the development agreement. Uh, the city council public hearing is scheduled for November 15th to review all of the recommendations and consider a final decision. Um, and just lastly, as a plug for anyone interested in receiving ongoing email notification of this project, please uh, visit our city website and sign up for those email alerts. Um, this concludes staff's presentation. Um, staff does recommend that the EPC recommend the City Council adopt resolution certifying the EIR, recommend uh, adopting and approving um, the master plan, as well as uh, the vesting tentative map and the parkland dedication credit being requested by the applicant. Um, staff does have tonight representatives from the Housing Division as well as the Public Works Department as well as representatives from all of our consultant teams um, available for questions as well. Um, on that note, the applicant does have a presentation and Jeff Hosea and Martin Wiggins from Google Lendlease will be presenting. Thank you. We uh, bring them forward. Thank you. Hold on one second while I find my screen here. All right. Uh, make sure everybody can see that because I can't see any faces now. So I can see it. All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having us, Chair Cranston, commissioners and staff. My name is Jeff Ozea, and I'm Google's urban planning lead for Mountain View. We're really happy to present our Middlefield Park master plan tonight. Uh, staff obviously has done a great job outlining several key topics, um, so I will try to keep this as short as I can and not duplicate too much. Uh, I, I do want to be sure to thank Lindsay in particular, but all of the staff of the city for all the work over the last many years. Uh, to actually bring this project to where we are today. Um, it's been it's been a joy to actually work with the staff. So um, I'm joined tonight by Martin Wiggins from Lendlease and a, and a host of others, but uh, Martin in particular, I hope you can jump in and introduce yourself here. Yep, hi, uh, my name is Martin Wiggins and I'm the Senior Development Manager for Lendlease working on Middlefield Park. As Google's master plan advisor and residential development partner, Lindley's has been so grateful to work with staff and the community over these last two years to develop this plan for new housing and parks in proximity to transit and jobs. So we're just honored to be here with you tonight and we'll be available to answer any questions. Perfect, thanks Marty. Uh, so, th the city approved the East Westman Precise Plan back in 2019, which sets out the vision to transform the area by adding housing near jobs, transit, parks, and local serving businesses. Our Middlefield Park proposal goes beyond compliance with the Precise Plan, expanding on its guiding principles, and then delivering a comprehensive community benefits package. Um, building on that Precise Plan, our goal for Middlefield Park is to be a sustainable, welcoming, and vibrant neighborhood. Uh, focused on health and well-being, 
and the, and one that really shifts from being car centric to people centric, meaning we want to prioritize walking, biking, public transit, and community health. Today, over half hey, the Jeff, site. Yes. I hate to interrupt you. I I'm still seeing the first slide, and I have a feeling you're meaning to you clicked through. It could just be me, I, but I wanted to make sure everyone's seeing your current slide. I did. I am on the site plan. Okay. Yeah. Could be me. Uh, right. Seeing the, the first slide. Hmm. Okay, let me stop and try to reshare. Apologies for that. Okay, let's see if it keeps up. <laughs> um, so uh, it really shifting from car centric to people centric. And I think I you know, described that a little bit about really prioritizing walking and biking. Um, today, over half the site is surface parking lots. Uh, so we're proposing to convert almost 40% of the site to parks and open space, another 25% to much needed housing, uh, plus new retail and community spaces. Everything is designed to be within a 10 minute walk centered around uh, BTA's Middlefield light, light Rail Station. And then we are also additionally targeting platinum certification under the Lead for Neighborhood Development that includes housing of up to 1,900 new homes with 20% of those affordable, as Lindsay said, uh, open space that's over 12 acres, and then rebuilt a new office space totaling about 1.3 million square feet. Uh, phasing begins with all residential on four different parcels, two market rate buildings at the corner of Ellis and Middlefield, and then two affordable residential parcels that will be dedicated to the city in the first phase. And phase one also includes the building of Ellis Plaza, which is two and a half acres of parkland that will, that will be delivered up front and early. Phase two is focused on rebuilding the office square feet that's been demolished in order to build phase one. We then follow up with the remainder of the residential in phase three, and then the new office occurs in, in the last, last in phase four. Since we submitted our master plan to the city back in September of 2020, uh, we've hosted two large format public community meetings, as well as met with a number of local and regional organizations, uh, some of which are listed here. Uh, we also conducted a community survey and hosted a community open house on site in August. Over 140 community members attended to learn about the project and enjoy some fa fun, family-friendly activities and food. We've received a ton of great feedback, incorporated it as, as much as we possibly could into the project, um, and then actually received questions that made us think and, and go further too. So the, the feedback has been amazing to make the project better. As I mentioned earlier, the project is front-loading housing, delivering up to 850 of the 1,900 homes in the first phase. 20% of all the homes in the master plan area will be affordable through the project's land dedication strategy. As the staff report states, and I think Lindsay said the same thing, the alternative mitigation proposal provides a greater benefit than providing on-site units, in part by allowing the city to deliver 95 more affordable homes than requested by code, required by code. Additionally, the strategy will allow the city to serve lower income renters across a deeper range of affordability from 60% AMI and below. Further, the city will be able to, de to decide on the size and mix of these units. On-site services could also be made available to residents who would otherwise have to travel off-site for such services. And the city will continue to own the land in perpetuity, allowing the city to best serve the needs of the community over the long term. At a high level, this is our parks and open space network. This is one of the cornerstones of the master plan. This has been refined based on input from both planning and park staff. So we want to thank them for all the time they put into helping develop this open space network. As mentioned in the phasing plan, we're not just giving the city land for them to build parks on. We are actually delivering almost two acres of Ellis Park in phase one at no cost to the city. Bringing a vibrant new plaza and park online in the, in the very first phase will support new, small, and local businesses, encourage transit use, and give us a head start on expanding the tree canopy growth. 
we've gotten a lot of excellent input from the community on what they'd like to see in the park and we're really appreciative of that guidance and it's helped us create a park concept that will better support the community around us. Uh, with the tree canopy coverage, we plan to double and nearly triple the tree canopy on our land by the time the plan is built out. With an additional seven acres of land where the city will build new parks, the tree, that tree canopy amount will be even greater. And as we get into architectural design, we'll be looking at opportunities for rooftop terraces or gardens that can add even more. This is all key to helping Middlefield Park become a resilient and sustainable community where people want to gather and live. Google's also in the process of planting nearly 14,000 trees right now in Gilroy at our tree farm. Uh, they consist of about 26 native species and right now are the size of about 15 gallon equivalent or larger. Uh, so as a reminder, you know, we're, we're all, we're planting these directly into the ground in grow bags, which should yield larger trees contributing to bigger canopies and thicker trunks compared to typical box trees as well. Lindsay did a great job of outlining the community benefits, but you know, our overall package here is totaling $30 million, far exceeding the city's requirements with the majority invested in the first phase, including our small business diversification program. We're further supporting these new businesses by building out the Ellis Park in the first phase as well, and bringing in more than a thousand residents in that same first phase. Most of the $19 million is required for bonus FAR office, but as the staff report showed, most of that new office isn't delivered until the last phase of the development. So this is a significant upfront investment in the community. So we greatly appreciate the opportunity to collaborate with the city and the community to deliver on the vision of the East Wisman Precise Plan. Thank you to the commissioners for your consideration tonight. And like I said, uh, we look forward to answering any questions you may have, uh, either myself, Marty, or a, a number of others that are online listening. So appreciate the time. Thank you. So the, uh, the next portion of the meeting is an opportunity for commission members to ask questions of staff applicant. Uh, so uh, we will open it up for EPC questions. Commissioner Clark. Um, I just have one based on the letter we received from the uh, Coalition for Sustainable Planning um, regarding the the discrepancy between, I believe, the consultant's report on, on looking at how uh, many of the affordable housing units could fit um, on that on that side versus um, I think the analysis that was uh, provided um, either by the applicant or, or, or through staff. The, the resisted difference in numbers and I mean, my assumption is that that really comes down to how um, you know the the um, the layout of the units, the bedroom counts, and those sorts of things, and and how those were analyzed. Um, is that the case, or is there there more to the discrepancy that we should um, be worried about? Um, Commissioner Clark, I'm assuming that I'm not sure if that's a question for staff or the applicant, but um, are you referring to sort of the targets within the precise plan, or are you specifically referring to the affordable housing? It's specifically the affordable housing. So it's the 20% of, of uh, uh, which would, I think, in at least per the letter, it would be 380 units. Um, but the the SIFL strategic economics analysis concluding that only 338 could be delivered on the, the two parcels of 2.4 acres. So I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm just, my assumption is that, you know, with the land dedication, if the city wants to somehow get to 380, they, they probably can. It's just a matter of the, the unit mix and and how it's laid out. But I just wanted to confirm that that, that is a, we've determined that that's a viable number for that site. Yeah, so um, the 380 units or the 20% uh, is really what the applicant sort of brought forward as part of the proposal. Um, and in terms of what Cycle Consulting uh, laid out in their report, which was 338 units, that's really based on a particular type of affordable housing, in this case, family housing. Um, and that was something that was decided, you know, for staff to look at because that was, that's a typical or a common type of affordable housing we see in Mountain View. Uh, it seemed appropriate for this area of the city, um, but also it is a way, uh, as some can say, it's a conservative assumption of 
how many units you could fit on this site for an affordable housing project because family affordable housing often results in fewer units based on larger units um, and more bedrooms and things like that. So um, the difference there is really just based on sort of the assessment that was done, you know, to analyze this proposal. I think another key point um, that uh, I think you're sort of getting at is um, ultimately, you know, if this master plan is approved and the land is dedicated to the city, the city has the discretion and decision to decide what type of affordable housing can go there. And different types of affordable housing um, can yield different unit counts. Um, and so uh, the ability to potentially, you know, achieve 380, uh, I can't say, you know, that is the possibility. It just depends on ultimately what is proposed and decided upon, um, not only from council's direction, uh, but also what an affordable housing developer brings forward. Um, Got it. That's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Krishna, uh, here Thank you. Um, and I think I saw Renee on the call tonight. So maybe this is a question for either Lindsay or Renee. I wanted to better understand, um, it sounds like despite the scale of this project, there is not an anticipated significant impact on the utility system, but I didn't quite follow the comment, and this is at the very end of the staff report on page 31, about a large portion of the recycled water customer base to be removed in East Wisman. So can you walk me through that? Is it, there, there's some the project would still be eligible for recycled water, but I don't quite understand what that meant. Good evening, yes, I'm on the call. My name's Renee Don, I'm a senior civil engineer, and um, Krishna was promoting me to panelist. So the last part I heard was you were asking about the recycled water base. Yeah, I just didn't understand the, the comment. So I, this area, the master plan area, will still be supplied by recycled water? using Correct. existing pipes? Okay, that's what I wanna make sure. Correct, the the master, the recycled water master plan that was approved by council just a few months ago still shows that we are going to eventually get out to the East Wisman area with the recycled water system. Great, thank you. And I don't know if it's just me, but unfortunately, Lindsay and Renee, the audio is cutting in and out a little bit. Um, so it's sometimes a little hard to hear, but thank you, I got my answer. And I don't, so I may, uh, I'm going to throw one in thing here. I asked a question about this of Len Lease during my meeting with him, and Martin had some specific discussion about the impact if they did the, the, the on site. It might actually be helpful to you, for you to hear that. Um, it was, because I asked that question of if you did the on site utilities versus that. So, Martin, could you elaborate on? on how that on-site would imp could impact the use of recycled water or clean water from the city. Yes, I thank you, Chair Cranston. I will do my best. And uh, just for city staff, we also have a district system specialist from Google, Drew Wenzel, and so he's standing by if we want to um, dive any deeper. I, if I'm recalling our discussion, Chair Cranston, uh, I think what I probably would have said was there's an within the district system there are three different systems. There's thermal, there's microgrid, and there's um, a recycled water system, which collects wastewater from the buildings and, and creates um, recycled water to you to pipe back to the buildings within the master plan. And so if we proceed with that option and we're producing our own recycled water, then the um, we would not in that case be using the recycled water that is coming through the city's expanded infrastructure. Is that helpful? Yeah, thanks. Um, other questions, Vice Chair Yen? Thanks. Um, actually, I was going to go back to the affordable housing um, question, which was related to what Commissioner Clark had asked. And I was just wondering, maybe this is for staff, if council will have enough information. So for instance, um, the unit count, Google has proposed one, and I, I understand these are estimates at this time, um, and the consultant has produced another. Has anyone asked the nonprofit 
that build the affordable housing what they think um, they could get out of it since they will most likely be building it and it would be their architecture firms designing it. That's one question. And also if there's an associated sort of estimated cost that would go with it. Um, and there's a, a second part to this question, which is the, the unit distribution. I know the jobs housing linkage, and maybe my memory is off, um, was for every thousand square feet of office, there's about three units. But we know, as we're talking about, that a studio is very different from a three bedroom for a family. So I, I don't recall the specific language for the jobs housing linkage. Um, so maybe you can refresh me on that because maybe that'll help in determining um, sort of what, what the technical goal is of the jobs housing linkage. And then we could kind of move from there. In the discussion. Sure. I think, um, Krisha, if you could promote um, Michaela Helen Tinker, and she can, um, from our housing division, could help also respond to this. But um, Commissioner Yin, I, th I think a couple things, uh, if I can remember all your questions. Uh, the first one, um, so the evaluation that was done by Seifel Consulting actually was based on feedback that we got from the affordable housing developers. So a lot of that work is incorporating that feedback um, in terms of um, what could be done. I will say uh, it's not like we were talking specifically to them about, hey, here's a site. What would you do exactly on this site? Because um, we didn't really have all that information available fully at that time. But we did talk about um, sort of the growing trends of affordable housing and what they're, they're accomplishing in some of their current uh, projects. Um, the other part of your question, um, which I'm unfortunately blanking on your second question. Is whether or not there was sort of an evaluation of cost associated with it so that the city council could determine whether or not this is something that is feasible because, you know, it is, I've got to say that it is great that Google had listened and is providing these great potential benefits by delivering the land and doing it early. Um, but, in, you know, and that would be a terrific win-win situation. However, um, you know, the ideal was inclusionary units and this is an alternative mitigation. So if we're doing an alternative, I wanted to make sure that in the win-win scenario that we actually as a city win. So that would be determined by cost and unit type and makeup. And that that's what I'm, I know we're at still the master plan stage, but it would be good to know that we can achieve feasibly the goal that city is trying to aim for. Yeah, and I think what you're hitting on is kind of the balancing act with a proposal like this, where mm -hmm. um, a lot of the work that strategic and insightful consulting did was really based on what we can sort of best know and assume now. <laughs> um, and so that did include uh, the funding needs component, uh, where taking the 338 units and kind of uh, laying out uh, a potential sort of uh, financial or fiscal aspect to it um, and what that funding need would be to actually deliver those units. Um, so that was included in, in that exhibit. Um, and the sort of intent uh, with that was really, to your point, to try and bring forward what this actually means um, if, if this is going to be considered by uh, decision makers. Um, and I think just the last point real quick before I hand it off to Michaela is um, the job housing linkage, uh, so you have it correct. It's basically three residential units for every thousand square feet of net new office development. Um, there's no particular uh, specificity on the type of housing unit. It's just housing units in general. Um, and so with that, uh, Michaela, did you have anything to add as well? No, you covered it very well, Lindsay. Happy to chime in on any other questions, though. Okay, um, sorry, just a, a little additional question tagged on is, and maybe Michaela, you know this, um, you were saying that the market for affordable housing is really looking for what type of unit? Um, because I know, for, at least for the market rate, um, Google in the, sorry, the staff report had stated that, or was it the, sorry, there were so many exhibits, I don't remember where this came from, um, that for market rate housing, market is showing that studio units are in demand but i wanted to know what is in demand for affordable housing because 
honestly, I don't know why there's a difference, but just go ahead and tell me since you know the answer for the affordable portion. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so there's a couple factors at play that um, helped us to determine what uh, market or what unit mix we would be looking at as likely for these sites. And of course, you know, because these are sites are dedicated to the city, ultimately we will have the discretion of whatever unit mix we think is right for the city at that time. But mm -hmm. the reason that we looked at a family mix, which typically means around a little over 50%, two and three, two and three bedrooms, um, is twofold. One is that um, many of the funding opportunities that exist right now prefer that unit mix. So there's um, more funding available for projects that have that. But more importantly, um, in the city right now, a very, very large percent of our affordable housing units are studios and one bedrooms. We don't have very many two bedrooms and three bedrooms, and our demand is highest for twos and threes right now in the city because of that mismatch. So that's, we also know that this is a priority. This is something that's in our housing element. It's discussed with the city council in our recent study session to get more what we call large family units, which would be twos and threes. Okay, so there is a high demand for it and partially due to the lack of it elsewhere. Okay, thank And you. also partially, I should just say, because of the cost of um, having a larger family and trying to afford housing. Ah, yes, okay, thanks a lot. Commissioner Nunez. Commissioner Nunez. Screen looks frozen. I don't know if we lost it. Um, I'm going to jump to Krishna Gutierrez and just, and Krishna Nunez, if you can hear us, let us know. Um, we all we're seeing is a black screen and not seeing any response. Uh, Commissioner Gutierrez. Sure. So I have a quick question. So um, I appreciate the majority of the housing coming on board for the city is the first step, which is great. And a lot of hard work went into making this happen through community input and uh, Google's diligence, which is wonderful to see. Um, it, it, my question is more of a light hybrid one in terms of uh, the park allocation space. I, I noticed that there was an area that designated for um, either a certain type of field or a dog park. In, in the end, through this process, when do you foresee a decision like that coming down the pipe? Because uh, I'm sure there's people interested to find out you know, how that process works and if they could pitch into the voice in one or the other, when could they do that? Yeah, so I'll just start off by saying, um, so right now at the master plan level, the design that, that you kind of see of that Ellis Park open space is um, conceptual. So really it's kind of a maximum amount of elements you might see in it. Um, so there is some room for things shifting. Um, but in terms of when the details would be known is really when the R1 and R2 uh, building designs come forward and are submitted as part of that phase one uh, zoning permit. Um, so that would be part of that first phase that you would see a lot of that stuff. Um, I will note that a portion of the Ellis Popa open space is also in phase two for the office building that's along Ellis. So not all of it will come online at once, but um, the designs would be provided, uh, you know, comprehensively uh, for that space. Okay, great. And then my second question is in terms of funding, what's the, how's that going to be looked at by the city council and then by us in general, um, are we looking to, and, and bear with me, as many of you know, I'm, I'm new to the EPC, so I'm gonna ask some basic questions sometimes, like right now. Um, the probability of funding and uh, getting that, that that money to be able to make a difference with this type of construction, what are we looking for when in, when searching for that and, and how big are the coffers if we have any within the city in terms of current funding? What's the strategy like for that? Um, Commissioner Gutierrez, I'm, I'm assuming you're referring to the affordable housing? Yep. Okay. Um, so I don't know if we want to bring back Michaela um, to help answer that question, but um, really the funding commitments from the city would officially be coming online uh, once that land is dedicated and the city is pursuing development on those sites. However, I will note um, that uh, with the recent discussions at council about the affordable housing strategy, we have a whole pipeline laid out and uh, 
for best that we can do for a project that hasn't been approved, <laughs> we have um, started to integrate and at least associate the idea that uh, these land dedications could be coming online. And so potentially incorporating them into our pipeline should, um, should these master plans, both this one and North Bayshore be approved. Um, so Michaela, I don't know if you have anything to add about sort of the availability of funding and commitments for that, for the affordable sites. Sure, thank you. Um, at our August 30th study session with the council, we uh, laid out our estimated funding needs for the city's affordable housing pipeline over the next five years. And we did include these two land dedication sites in our guess of what our pipeline might look like. Um, and we uh, estimated how many funds we currently have in our coffers, as you said, um, how much we expect to get in future fees, and then what the funding gaps that we expect may be. And we do expect a funding gap over our whole pipeline. We have a very ambitious pipeline in the city of Mountain View. Um, but we also laid out in the study session a strategy for hoping to fill that funding gap so we can achieve the pipeline. And that includes several measures, including um, reviewing our commercial impact fees, making partnerships with public agencies to increase um, funding availability, making partnerships with private companies um, and philanthropic agencies to increase funding availability. And then the last piece is um, partnering with the regional um, BAFA on their uh, housing funding measure that we hope will uh, bring in significant funds for affordable housing. Um, and there's some additional state funds that we are currently seeking that um, may or may not also add to that. So essentially we anticipate a funding gap, but we also have strategies um, in place that we are currently pursuing to hopefully fill that funding gap. Great, thank you. Um, so we is, uh, welcome back. You're, you were next when, uh, when we lost you. So, uh... Yep, uh, technology glitch. If Commissioner Dempsey wants to go, I'd be happy to, okay. Go ahead, you were first, Alex. All right, don't know what happened there. Um, so, I'm glad I at least got to hear that last bit of um, what I think was Commissioner Gutierrez's question around some of the funding um, related to the affordable units. Um, so I guess a, a, a few questions here um, with, I, and it's hard to know exactly where to start, um, but I'm gonna kind of take a stab here first. Um, with regards, this is a question for staff, uh, what is, the typical or i get uh, just across all projects not just projects of this kind but just like all projects that um are coming through the community development department um is there quantified or even you know um if anyone on the call right now could take their best stab at what the average development agreement length is um for projects that are coming through the pipeline in terms of years? Um, I don't know that we have a specific number, but I can say uh, some of the recent development agreements that have been um, approved for uh, single phase development projects uh, are typically seven years that have been approved. Um, okay. So this would be a, a longer DA. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of those single phase, uh, development agreements, how big do they get in terms of level of like units or development, like scale? Um, again, I don't have all the data on that, but I can say that um, uh, all of the DAs that I'm aware of uh, in recent history are all associated with office development projects and not housing or residential development. Okay, um, interesting. Okay, so I'll, I'll kind of um, ask a, a few other questions. So I guess this one is for uh, Jeff, um, the applicant. Jeff, hi, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> in terms of that, I think that first slide, the um, phase one slide that you showed or that part of the process, um, I noticed that the parcels for the affordable uh, land dedication were included as part of that phase one can, can can you help clarify what it means with regards to the inclusion or, or like the um the reasoning or you know yeah the how how this is included into that phase one like just yeah I, 
Absolutely. I, I can definitely take a shot at, at starting that, and Martin can come in behind me for sure. So as you noted, the, the phase one in the lower left along Middlefield and Ellis, that's the market rate um, residential. There's two buildings there. And then the two affordable uh, projects, parcels are, are over on Mott Avenue. Um, you know, we chose those sites in particular because A, we, we can, we have the ability to make them shovel ready uh, just as soon as we possibly can. So that expedites the delivery of those, the, de the de dedication of those to the city. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think that's a, that, that's definitely a bonus to the city. Um, you know, there, there's a number of other reasons. It's, it's well integrated within the neighborhood. Even the surrounding parcels as the precise plan continues to build out, uh, will add more residential around these. So they, you know, they will be fully integrated within the, uh, within the neighborhood for sure mm -hmm. okay. um so yeah. by phase one it really it's sounding to me correct me if i'm wrong but it's sounding to me like phase one means that those two uh parcels along mod and the highway phase one includes the transfer the land transfer it's not right like it's not up to that 380 it's it means like as a phase one we will have transferred by the completion of that phase one, we will have transferred those parcels to the city. Yes, yeah, the, the legal transfer of the land. You're absolutely right. Okay, cool. Um, and then with regards to, I guess, our um, our consultants, a Seifel, Stiefel, I forget, um, Seifel. Um, I have a question, if, if, if okay, for them. Um, I noticed as part of the uh attachment with regards to the uh analysis of the alternative mitigation that the uh the analysis was created based off of 2021 uh estimates or, or standards for the the prevailing costs at that time around like i guess like what it, whatever the inputs would be around like material um labor costs land costs etc i just want to make sure i um, i was confirming that with the with our consultant yes that's true can you see i, I don't know why i'm not on the screen but can you hear me mm -hmm. yes yeah. that is correct okay cool and then i'm one thing i'm actually because I, I i heard commissioner yin um speak to or, or ask questions relating to this affordable um uh kind of unit alternative mitigation i think commissioner gutierrez was asking about something similar i had a computer glitch sorry everyone but i think he was asking about something similar um and uh, to be honest my questioning was around that as well and so i guess one of the things that i'm thinking through because i noticed that um, in that alternative mitigation report, the, the the figures were based off of 2021 numbers, you know, before, um, you know, a lot of that like supply chain crisis stuff was really hitting the news. I'm sure it was going on before, but like really started to escalate in a way that was, you know, publicly conscious, um, ongoing inflation, you know, like 8.7%, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I guess I'm, one thing I'm very curious about is, um, to what extent does your analysis conduct a risk assessment for whether or not um, these units can actually be um, you know, delivered into physical reality um, or would not, I guess the risk assessment would be, you know, to what extent um, did you guys assess because I see a lot of word in there like potential, the potential value, the land transfer, et cetera, et cetera. But to what extent did you guys conduct a risk assessment of, you know, what could prevent those units from actually being developed into reality by an affordable housing developer in partnership with the city? Um, and what were the results of that risk assessment? We didn't specifically do a risk assessment. Um, I think in the way that you're framing it. However, we did look at a lot of the city's current projects and historical projects that the city has been doing that we've worked on over the years. And um, I would just say the following, 
that um, the hope is, of course, we don't know what will happen with the supply chain, but the hope is that, you know, as interest rates increase, as the Fed, you know, makes some moves, that there will be some abating and construction cost increases. So there is that, there is that hope that that will abate. Um, obviously, no guarantee, but there's that hope. Uh, secondly, alongside of this, there is a recognition on both the public sector side and the private sector side of just the need for more funding for affordable housing, as Michaela articulated earlier. So um, there are um, there is the other side of it where funding is just really being recognized as being more and more pivotal. And but you know, last I would just say that you know it 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 we never know what it's going to take to get these delivered. But the fact that this land is getting dedicated to the city as public land, and that the city can do what it would like to do on it with respect to affordable housing, I think makes a significant difference in mitigating the risk because the city is in control and can try to address whatever risks occur. Mm -hmm. So it it is it's fair to say that the city is in control of what they would plan in partnership with an affordable housing developer, um, what they would plan to develop or construct on that site, right? But I'm I, I guess my question would be: Would you agree that the city and affordable developers are in control of external factors that? any developer I believe would say are extremely that they're extremely sensitive to when it comes to the you know feasibility of a project or that could impact the feasibility of a project absolutely the developers are sensitive to whatever's going on at the time of development absolutely true um but that's 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 what developers have to deal with on a daily basis so um I think that it is really helpful for the city to have the ability to make some of the decisions that it would not normally be able to make by owning the property. Mm -hmm. So then, yeah, because what I'm trying to understand, and, and I'm hoping you can help me understand this, is um, in what form does um, the city being able to plan for what they would like to build on that land make up for the risk of any external factor risk that would prevent the city from actually executing on those plans. I can uh, jump in yeah. here. Yeah, do, do. Um, I'm not sure we know the risk of the external factors de preventing development. Um, this is an issue we face for all of our developments in our pipeline. Um, I think the the benefit that you're getting at, you know, is it a mitigation that we have the land dedication is that should there be some sort of factor that is out of our control um, that makes development infeasible, like you know, a spike in construction costs that was unanticipated or a pandemic, although we managed to get some great affordable housing online during the pandemic. Um, the difference in this case compared to if um, we are working with affordable developer who own their own land is they may have to sell their land to, you know, make up the lost cost um, because there's holding costs associated with the land. Whereas in this case, there wouldn't be that the city owns it and we could wait and ride out that risk or find a way to mitigate that risk and then develop. So um, I think we all are interested in having the units be developed as quickly as possible. And that's their housing division's current strategies to pursue that. But should there be a risk like that, it wouldn't be a an end game for those developments like it might be if the city was not the owner of the land. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I appreciate that, Michaela. And I, I guess like my hang up is, you know, I, I what I just heard you say was, should there be a risk like that? Um, and I'm concerned that there wasn't assessment. There was not an assessment of that possibility, even right. We can't assess for all the infinite number of risks. But what was the assessment done of the potential risks, right? Um, and so I guess uh, Jeff, I'm, I am going to ask you in terms of that 20-year development agreement. Um, what is the reasoning for seeking a two-decade uh, development agreement? Like what? What are what is Lend Lease and Google 
going to be able to do with those 20 years that they couldn't do in 10, for example, or 15, or any lesser arbitrary number of years? Sure. Um, so I, I can I, again. I'll start, but there's a there's a number of people that are probably more more educated than I am on it as well. As as Lindsay said, um, you know, typical development agreements of seven years for a, a single phase, like one building, one office project, um, it is pretty typical. So as we you know look to do four different phases, have to demo some parcels, build others and then rebuild and then continue on. There's a process to it. So, um, you know, part of it comes down to housing absorption as well. We don't want to build residential and have any empty units sitting. So we need to make sure that the first phases are full before we move into the next phases. And then over 20 years, typically there's seven to eight year economic cycles, like the one we're in right now. Um, and so, you know, this will allow us to either, you know, to, to stretch past that one of those next economic cycles and, and be able to weather that storm, both um, with the city and, and with this agreement. So, you know, with having the, the new office built in the last phase, um, it, you know, it, it helps us, you know, push that out a little bit longer. Of course, we hope we can do it sooner than that. Um, but th this is a, a pretty tight timeline to develop this much, you know, to develop 40 acres, honestly. So, um, yeah. Last question, I swear. Um, <laughs> are you guys planning to use um, union labor for the construction? We, we have a great partnership with a number of, of the labor unions. And so, yeah, so, uh, this is uh, something that we would look to be, you know, using again on this project as well. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Commissioner yeah. Dempsey. Thank you, Chair. So I have three questions. Uh, one about parking and uh, two about air quality. So the parking questions for staff. So Lindsay, um, if you want to fill this one. Um, on page 26 of the staff analysis, it says uh, they talk about um, parking. And so for this master plan for active use parking which i understand is largely kind of around the park right the plan provides about i think they said about two spots per thousand square feet does that sound about right am i getting my numbers right um for what was studied in um the study that was prepared by the city it was uh, about three four spaces per thousand for active use Four. Okay, because I had I my understanding was is that the project did something like two, but the when the city did the study, they found that it was normally about three point six eight. Am I remembering this wrong? Uh, no, you're correct. The applicant um, has proposed uh, two spaces per thousand. Okay, that, yeah, that's what I thought. So I want to ask about that because I guess I want to know. Tell me why you're not concerned about that, and I'll let me let me add two other things before you answer. The first is, as I understand it, we aren't going to have street parking for some of the frontage, or at least for half of the street, uh, for some of the areas around the park. And that was to make space for bike lanes, which I completely support. Um, I also noticed that the parking garage, which I think there is some shared parking, is phase four, but the park is being put in in phase three. So that's temporary, but that would prevent the, the people using the park, which would be created from using parking, which only comes in phase four. So all, if you put all that together, I just want to help me understand why you weren't worried about insufficient parking for people coming to use the, uh, coming to use MOD. Yeah, so it's a great question. I think a couple things, um, just to be super clear. So no parking ratios have actually, are being proposed to be adopted with the master plan. Um, so the study and analysis that was done was really the city's way of analyzing what are potential parking ratios that might be appropriate um, to consider. And uh, those would really be locked in at subsequent permits that they submit for each phase. Um, getting at your specific question, so a couple things. Um, uh, in terms of parking for the active use spaces, those are proposed to be on the same site as um, those spaces are provided. So it would be on site that they would have parking available. Um, for Mod Park uh, in particular, 
this is true for any city park. Um, for, for over a five acre park, the city is likely gonna have some on-site parking like we do at Rainstorf Park um, or Cuesta Park. So some parking will be probably integrated into the design of that park. Um, there is also street parking, which is a common way for park users to park in and around the park area. Um, and then in terms of sort of what happens in the interim, uh, so while the district parking structures won't be built until phase four, um, the applicant is required to provide and plan for some kind of temporary parking situation, which will likely span multiple sites. Um, and so there is, you know, potential for an arrangement to be made potentially for parking related to that. But um, in terms of sort of specifically Mod Park, I think we would be accommodating some parking on site. Okay, so you are not ultimately worried about the ability to, to have enough parking for the people who will use it. I spend a lot of time on soccer fields on weekends, so this is something that I, I live this question all the time. Um, but if you're not worried about it, or if you feel like it's we're good enough now and that you can actually you know, uh, solve for it with more precision later on when the individual projects come up, you feel comfortable with it, then I'm comfortable with it, we're cool. Um, yeah, and just one thing to note real quick, it also really depends on what um, recreational elements are actually part of Mod Park. So yeah, if it's a field that generates certain parking, then if it's just sort of other recreational uses. So good point. Got it. Um, the next two questions are mostly for uh, for the applicants. So Jeff, if you wanna, if you wanna uh, take a crack at these, uh, it should be too hard. Um, and if you wanna throw up that phasing slide, actually the, uh, that, that, that was kind of important to me or it's important to the question. Um, first one's super easy, and it's just, is Google and Lendlease, are you planning on keeping all the buildings operational, even if they're in later phases uh, to be developed? I assume you're not going to end leases and kick anybody out. Are these going to be fully, like, people going to work and eating their lunch and doing their whole thing until you're getting ready to knock the building down? Uh, Martin probably knows a little bit more particulars, but most of the, a yep. lot of these buildings. Yeah, go ahead, Martin. I'll, I'll yeah, well, actually, it's the, a little bit, uh, Commissioner Dempsey, it's a great question. It's a little bit too early to say. Um, there is a contemplation to, there's certainly some demo that has to be done to prepare land to be dedicated to, to the city in phase one. So before we break ground on any construction, uh, we're dedicating almost three acres of land to the city for parks and affordable housing. And so we've got to clear the, those sites in advance. We may see the need strategically to clear more sites just for construction staging and phasing, um, et cetera. So there could be other sites that, that come down more quickly. Uh, and I think there will be other cases where it's safe, you know, likely, you can't say for sure, but likely that some people would be still working in, in the building and then sort of um, waiting for their new building to be done and then moving over to that building. So I think it's probably a bit of a mixed bag, and I don't know that we know today exactly how it would play out, but probably a little bit of both. Okay. Well, let me, the, here's the why I ask, and here's what my sensitivity is, and maybe you can just file this away. As we go through the process of planning to build a place that we really want to be activated, right? We want people hanging out there, having coffee and walking the dog and throwing a Frisbee um, and taking their kids to the soccer games like I'll be doing. What I wouldn't want to see happen, and I've seen this, I've seen this occur with other uh, office buildings, where the tenants leave and the office building sits dormant, sometimes for years. And what I wouldn't want to see happen is um, for this to turn into a bit of a ghost town because there's a bunch of spaces that are now just bereft of people, and and that ends up kind of leaving a weird vacuum um, that's that's not appealing. I think that that's actually sort of the opposite of activation is kind of unsettling. So anyway, I would just say that as our goal is to make this active and lively, um, you might cut against that by clearing out whole sections and leaving it vacant for two years. So that was my sensitivity. Thank you for listening. Um, last one, I want to talk about air quality because I was real sensitive about this when we did 555. And I want to ask about LOG and I want to ask about R4A. So if I understand 400 LOG, is that is not actually in this master plan. It's it's a building that's between the, the twos. It's uh, south, it's to the bottom and to the right. It's right there, yeah, there you go. My understanding is that's the building 
that was flagged as having um, sort of unremediable uh, air quality problems during phase two construction. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And is that, is that a lend lease building? Do y'all, um, does Google own that? Okay. Uh, no, that is a separate developer that owns that property and is pursuing that project. Okay. Well, I hope you're having uh, very friendly conversations with them about um, all the dust that's going to be coming their way. Um, so I'm, a, I guess I'm, as long as you're going to try to work that out with them, and it looks, if, if I recall from the staff report, as long as everybody keeps their windows shut, it'll be fine, right? Um, in terms of, uh, yeah, in terms of uh, current building code requires certain MERV air filters, uh, which, yeah, if they kept their windows closed and doors closed, um, that it would mitigate it down 80%, so it would be below the significant impact and it would be considered less than significant. But I do want to just mention, you know, the city nor the developer can really control what happens on that site. And so conservatively, that's why we've assumed a significant unavoidable impact is because we can't dictate if those doors and windows stay open or closed. Totally fair. The good news is it's that's a commercial building, as I understand it. Or um, is, a, is a commercial building going in? Is that the new one? Um, so it's a commercial building today. It is proposed to be a residential building with oh, residential is. units. Yep. Okay. Um, well, that, you know, that it always worries me a little bit when we're doing infill like this, um, because it's easy to forget the people that live there uh, that have to live in a construction zone. Um, and, you know, I imagine there'll be conversations with folks about just, you know, keep your windows shut for the next two years. I sure hope they all have air conditioning. Um, but I guess all I would do is ask that you really, really treat the folks there as neighbors, whether, you know, especially if you don't own the building. Um, because you're asking a lot of them. You're asking a lot of them. Because for some folks, they'd rather leave the window open and save the money and not pay for air conditioning, right? But this is going to be two years of air conditioning, and that's not insubstantial. So I just I want to make sure we all flag that, that there is a cost being put on the people that live there, um, and they're not your tenants. So that same concept applies perhaps even more with R4A. So that's that little chunk, that, the little chunk of one that sits in the middle of three. So uh, this actually is a question for staff. Does the EIR address the air impacts for the folks that are gonna be living in R4A when phase three is completed? Because they are, they're gonna have a huge construction site on three sides of them with not much buffer. Was that addressed in the EIR? Um, so a couple things, one, um... Uh, it was identified in the AR that similarly placed residential development that occurs throughout the lifespan of this master plan are likely um, to have similar impacts as 400 log if they're sort of within similar distances. Uh, I will say, um, you know, part of this comes down to the timing of, of that R4A construction. Um, once they give us, you know, land, if this is approved, um, there is a lead time to do that. And since it's phase three that's sort of surrounding that site, there is a chance that we could be under construction around similar timelines um, by the time everything sort of pans out. So um, it's hard to really pre-assume if there might be an impact there or not. Okay, so you think it's actually quite possible then that construction could be concurrent? Um, or within a close time span. I mean, that's a possibility. Well, then, you know, uh, as long as it's covered in the EIR and as long as the city is looking at this, I simply want to flag again what is a sensitivity for me, which is looking out for the environmental health of folks that live in places when you're doing infill around them. Living in living in R4A, um, if, if that's already done and folks are, are inhabiting it, then having, if three pops up then after it, that could be, that could be a lot. That's a, That could be a lot to ask of people, especially if they got, you know, if they have asthma, or if they have other conditions that really complicate that, you know, two years of of, of diesel and, and paint fumes. Um, so I guess I would simply ask, please be very, very mindful as you're thinking about your mitigations. Um, just remember there's gonna be people living there and please treat them with the utmost kindness. Um, that's it, I'll get off my soapbox. That's all the questions I have, thank you. All right, um, so I have, a, I have a few. Um, I guess I, I, I just want to make sure this is absolutely, I, I think this is the answer that I read in this report, but Mr. Anderson, this is for you. Um, 
my read of the staff report and then Lindsay is that the fact that this potential um, air quality issue is coming up is because it was not studied in this forum in the original East Wisman Precise Plan EAR. And the way I read it, it sounds like any sufficiently large master plan within East Wisman or any of our areas could, in fact, trigger this. And it's not the, the this is not a Google Lindley specific issue. You make the master plan large enough, and we didn't include it in our EAR for the precise plan. This will get triggered. Is that fair? Yes, yeah, so I think um, a couple things. Um, the scale of the project, the amount of phasing that occurs, those are key functions that could have happened with it. You know, certain projects, you know, 555 as an example, West Middlefield, where it can trigger this significant impact. So this is not sort of only a situation that would happen uh, with a 40 acre master plan, but it can happen in other development projects. Um, I do want to note just just for clarity as well, the precise plan EIR really focused on meeting certain thresholds required for that type of policy document. And so the when any development is proposed in East Wisman, um, they actually all have to do this air quality analysis to make sure that they're consistent uh, with uh, what was either assumed in, in the precise plan EIR or um, you know, making sure they're below the thresholds that BACMED has for these project level. Um, developments. And so I guess my impression is if they submitted, if 10 different individual projects were submitted, none of those individual projects would have been likely to trigger this issue that comes up. Uh, it's only, it only comes visible because it's 10, it, we're looking at all 10 projects all at the same time, essentially 10 different buildings. Um, I guess that's one way to look at it. Yeah, is the scale kind of all of it happening um, as one project. Um, so yeah, that would be part of it. Okay. Um, some questions, is the CFO person still available? Yes. Um, did you, is it about air quality or? No, this is, a uh, re regarding the low market rate housing calculation, the alternative mitigation and the calculations. Are you available still? Um, yeah, so um, I guess John. what exactly is your question? Yes, so the um, the analysis highlighted a specific issue of the number of units that are being proposed on the two sites. Just like you did, I did my own research and I reached out to a, a person I know that is a nonprofit, a below market rate housing developer and said, hey, they're talking about putting 400 units in two spots do you agree this would be a problem? And what I heard was, yep, um, the state has a certain amount of funding. The sweet spot, as the report states in the, in the, in the summary, says the sweet spot's like 90 to 100 units. Um, whether this is 338 or 380, what you basically have is four times that amount. And that the, the, the state has a certain amount of money. And so when they look at projects, they say, hey, we can't put all of our money in one basket. So what would be likely to happen is that this would end up having to go through four phases, four phases of funding requests with the state of California in order to get enough money to pay for this many nonprofit units, okay, below market units. And it wasn't clear to me in CIFL's analysis that when they compared the, the, of the value of the two proposals, that the fact that we would have that developers would have to go through four phases, even if it was two different developers in the two properties that they would be unlikely to be able to get both of them approved by the state the state at the exact same year means that it's, it's going to take four years of design, just, just once the designs are ready to even be able to go and ask for the money. And that's a long time. And I know Michaela and, 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 and team went off and looked at this, but that's, that's a long time. And I didn't see that analysis. And so my question is, does the analysis that was done on the comparability of the alternative take that into account? And therefore, and if it doesn't, that means there is additional cost that will be incurred because that construction will be farther out into the future. They, work, they use the 5% inflation rate. And so I'm, I'm, I'm questioning the direct comparison of the two 
as was presented in the report. Sure. Okay. Yep. So, um, Krisha, can you bring back uh, Libby Seifel and uh, Michaela? Michaela, do you want to go first or do you want me to talk? Why don't you go right ahead, Libby? I'll join in after. Okay. Um, so thank you for your question. Um, we did we did look at this. I'm sorry if it wasn't clear enough in the write-up. It was discussed in the developer stakeholder meetings. Um, it is something that we did discuss with staff. Um, this will be a multi-phase project. You are correct. Okay, so you're, you're the time you did a time value calculation in order to make sure this is comparable. I didn't see any kind of interest rate, um, current present value evaluation done when I looked at the report. To be able to see you're, it, the two. You're you're you are correct. We did everything in constant dollars, so we're looking at. I mean, you know, that's the way the analysis typically we would do is we're looking at um, what it would be like at the time of development, assuming all things are equal. So we're using 2021 revenues, we're using 2021 costs, but obviously, um, you know, if, if, it, if it happens in the future, there will be increases on both sides. So you didn't assume that the city has to chase a bigger pile of money to do this? In the future, no. um, I that is. I think what you're saying is that our funding gap is looking at what the funding gap is as of 2021, um, and you are correct that there may be higher funding needs in the future, uh, depending on what the ratio is between development costs and revenues and what funding sources are available. But it it it's always um, a challenge with these projects to figure out exactly what it's going to be like in the future. So our best guess is to base it on what we know as of today or what we knew of as of last year when we did the analysis. Um, Michaela, can you? I mean, I guess I'm uh, I'm worried that we've we've under undervalued the um we've overvalued the, the the gift of the land i don't have much else to add um i think the one thing i guess i would add is um if other costs go up so will land costs so that's another factor that we'll have to just we would have to factor in um but typically as libby said we analyze things in the current costs and then when we're actually developing, we usually build in escalators um, based on the construction timelines. Libby, can you chime in on the time frame in terms of the phases? I think Chair Cranston had said, you know, this could take four years to raise the funds. I was under the impression um, that given the tax credit timelines, it certainly they could not apply necessarily in the same cycle, but that there are multiple cycles in a year. Can you chime in on that piece? Yeah, there. Um, there are multiple tax credit cycles. The state is trying to consolidate its state funding into more, you know, like it's got a supernova right now, which is at least initially targeted for once a year, but may end up being multiple times a year. Um, you know, we're we're all waiting to see exactly how that will roll out. But the idea of the supernova is that there will be more certainty for the development community as it applies for multiple funding sources from the state at the same time. Uh, so that, um, but in terms of timing for development, I mean, they're just like any project, the developer is going to have to go through a design process, um, work with the planning department, get approvals, and then will be, you know, once they are ready um, through that process, uh, and they know exactly, you know, they know more about what their construction costs are going to be, right? Because they have to have a certain level of design to get a pretty good idea of what their construction costs are going to be. They're then going to apply for funding. So 
that can take, you know, one or two years, just depending on what the timing is for the design and review and planning process. Um, and I don't know whether, I don't know whether this is a, this is a Michaela question or a Lindsay question. Um, the, the, it's related to the, the centralized services. I can't remember the name of it. Um, the common, the common electrical areas, the common, um, water, but also common heat. Is there anything in the development in the master plan the agreement that would that would potentially allow the, the the BMR sites that are given to the city to be able to leverage the benefit of those centralized facilities to be able to, um, to also get some of the benefit of that centralization. Uh, it sounded like from my meeting with uh, with Martin and, and Jeff that it could produce reduce energy costs by sharing power across the buildings. Um, the centralized Heating could reduce utility costs for those, and it could be something that actually could be. Is there anything in the development agreement that would preclude that? Is that is it, once it's dated, then we have no access to it, or is that something that could be considered for incorporation in, into what we're looking at? Yeah, so uh, you bring up a great, a great question. Um, so the way that the district system was analyzed um, in terms of sort of our utility analysis we did not assume connection to the two sites proposed to be dedicated. However, um, you know, in Google's proposal, it did incorporate those sites. And we do have language in the master plan materials that do speak to the fact that the city could connect at a future date, you know, if, if that's desired, but some additional analysis would need to be done. Um, so it's not to say it's an option completely off the table, but, um, but yeah. So it sounds like the DA doesn't exclude it, but it's not specifically included. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question. Um, this is just, this is Commissioner Gutierrez is fond of saying how he's new to stuff. This is a new thing for me. How likely, and, and uh, the Google and these people seem to make, think it was no big deal. Um, maybe there's a public worst person. The idea of, I'm, I'm, the idea of BTA saying, Carrie, bury, bury pipes and wires and things underneath our railroad tracks to be able to do this stuff. Um, is that fairly common? I just, I just, uh, you know. Yeah, uh, that's so, a, oh, um, so there's two factors here. There's the uh, proposed private district utility system that I think you're pointing out the central plan is proposed on the west side of the tracks, and then most okay. of the actual master plan area is on the east side. So um, Google, if they pursue that option, would be sort of jack and boring under the light rail tracks um, to install that infrastructure. Um, addition to that would be, you know, any future bridge the city builds would be going over the VTA tracks. Um, and so city staff, um, and including the public works staff, have met actually with VTA and the California Public Utility Commission, who's actually the ultimate um, authority on that rail. And um, they have procedures in place and processes in place to get permits and approvals for both of those types of things. Um, obviously they have specific requirements about sort of depths and distances away from their infrastructure to ensure that there's no um, impacts. Um, and that would be part of what would have to be demonstrated as part of that permitting process. Um, but uh, with those two improvements, as well as I'll add on to that, the mid block crossing and the bus stop modifications on Middlefield Road, those all sort of require CPUC and BTA approval. And um, in the conversations we've had with them, there has not been any indication that, that achieving approvals for those would be impossible or prohibited, um, it would just be ultimately abiding by their rules and regulations. Um, next question, and it wasn't clear to me whether C4 and strategic consulting are the same entity or not, but um, the value of the, um, the community benefit that would help um, you know, essentially 
um, women underrepresented um, organizations. Um, is that would that be indexed over a period of time? Um, as Commissioner Nunez highlighted, we're in a big inflation period. Um, does that that contribution, does the value of that increase over the period of the 20 years based on inflation, or is it 19 million and it stays 19 million forever? So, um, with, uh, let me back up. Um, so, two parts. One is really the heart of that question. I will pass off to the applicant because I think it's really part of their fundamental program that they can explain how that uh, works. But I will say, um, in terms of the valuations that were outlined in the report, all of that is in today's, you know, fee amounts and dollar amounts, um, and those do escalate every year. And so, uh, with approval of the DA, those would continue to escalate every year, um, in pace with our budget as well. Um, so, Martin or Jeff, I'm not sure who wants to answer that, but I could try to add a little color. Thank you. Uh, Lindsay, and thank you for the question, Chair Cranston. The the program has a number of parts to it. Uh, it's really a suite of tools to try to bridge gaps in allowing those small small and local businesses, nonprofits, underrepresented groups uh, to be able to participate in really in the heart of the community. So a big portion of it is just building the space. And so uh, that's definitely probably not going to remain in 2021, 2022 dollars. When we build the space, we'll have to build it wherever inflation is at wherever escalation all those costs run uh, there's another portion of the program that is kind of a, a tbd fund that's set aside for you know we want to go in and tailor the the needs to each group that that um, comes and participates in the program and those needs will change and in some cases those needs will be paid out through monetary contributions to them and so and uh, Lindsay, let me know if I'm saying anything that's inconsistent, but I think the idea with those components is that they're they're pegged sort of to inflation or, or to an index. So if it's something that's delivered in kind, that's it's constructed, uh, then it, it is sort of by definition set set to what things cost at that time. And if it's a if it's a monetary uh, contribution to that participating group, then that's tracked with uh, with an index. Is it, Lindsay, does that sound? Yeah, I think, um, Commissioner Cranston, I think you might be getting at sort of the capped rent or sort of some of the other uh, funding amounts well, that were specifically called out, and if those escalate. That's the next, that's the next question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, it, was, it was more the total value and how that's, okay. So is the, is the, is the capped rent escalating as well? It's capped at uh, at an index. It can grow no more than uh, I want to say it's a construction cost index. Um, and then I guess this is a Mr. Nunez is asking why the, is the DA is so long. My question was what happened if it happens promptly. So if everything's built in eight years. Does that mean this program goes away in eight years and all the all the benefits that you know where somebody might get for as long as 10, 20 years goes away after eight? How does that what how when does it end? Okay. Um, is it after 20 years? Is it regardless of when everything's finished? If Google and Len Lease finish everything and you know uh, in twenty thirty, does everything go away then? Or is it continued uh twenty forty two? Holy crap. <laughs> oh, um so the way, the, the way that the program um, is outlined in the project conditions and, in, and um, how it's being proposed is that it has to have a minimum lifespan of 10 years from when, once the space is completed. So um, that's a minimum no matter what. And then if it is the DA goes beyond the 10 year period, then it has to be the full length of that DA term that the DA is active. Um, so no matter what, it would be a minimum of 10 years. And longer than that, because that's 10 years from when a group moves into their storefront. And it's going to take us time after this, hopefully after this master plan is approved, if phase one zoning permit is approved, building permit is approved, building is built. All those things happen while the DA is in effect. And then someone moves in and then they get 
the, the ten the minimum ten years that Lindsay's talking about. So, all right, I'll I'll give somebody else a chance to ask questions. Commissioner Gutierrez. Hang in there, Martin. Hang in there, man. <laughs> Look, these are good questions. Uh, we're getting into the weeds, and that's great sometimes, and, and it's informative. Um, and so a couple of the questions I have, too, though, uh, pertains to just um, length of time. Looking at it from a different perspective from Chairman Cranston, um, the affordable housing aspect to it, you know, you've got anywhere from 320 to 380 units. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to build immediately. I mean, we still have time to be able to go out and seek funding. Now, we're also entering... Well, some would argue that we're already in a recession. I dare say that within the next two to three years, I don't think that economic situation is going to be too peachy king around here. So uh, if we think about the long-term value of holding the asset of the land, and here's a question. I don't think there is a time limit for us to be able to set forth this construction uh, project and, and, and move forward with it. We, we can afford to wait until we come out of this recession so that it is at that point an opportune time for us to then um, propose the plans, get the construction going along with uh, the monies that we'll need. And at that time, I would think that the cost of construction wouldn't be as high as it is now. And so if we look at it from that economic perspective, there's still an opportunity to gain some wealth from that by being uh, diligent enough and not to start something now when it could be problematic. By the time you begin, so it is if unless I'm mistaken, is there a time limitation for when we can submit our application for, um, you know, the low income, the uh, affordable housing aspect to it, uh, or not? Um, Krisha, if you could bring back Michaela, I think um, getting at your question, uh, usually folks are not seeking funding until there's an actual proposal on the table. So um, it would really be. Uh, necessary for us to either release uh, an RFP or an RFQ to start that process. And um, as part of uh, Michaela and the housing team's efforts, we're really trying to be diligent, diligent about how we plan to release that and timing of that and trying to be as proactive as we can within the parameters that we have. Um, we have to be really careful about not sending out requests for proposals if we don't actually have the land <laughs> delivered to us and know all the details of the land. So, um, Michaela, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. All right. Okay. So, so then in essence, that's the advantage of being able to at least have the land now once this is done. And then at the time when it's appropriate, based on my understanding of what you've said now, then the city can move forward with its plans to do X, Y, Z. And then we can look at it with more real numbers at that time. Knowing that right now, yes, yes. So knowing that right now, if we were to rush into it, economically speaking, it may, it may be too expensive. But two or three to four years from now, it may not be. Well, and I think the, also the lead time of all this stuff does take a couple of years. So um, things can change during that time span uh, as well. Um, but yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Commissioner Indians. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Cranston. Um, this question is for, um, I guess, either uh, Jeff or anyone from Langley's, whoever was there. <clears throat> I guess um, my question is, um, oh, however many years ago at whatever like group or team meeting it was, um, where the idea to um, offer up the separate land dedication uh you know for the affordable units to the city as an alternative mitigation um i guess like my question is you know if, if i can you know kind of prompt it a little bit it's like um whoever it was who said something along the lines of hey guys i have a great idea why don't we offer up the land uh to the city they can develop all the affordable housing over there and we can develop all the residential market rate and office and retail over here. That's a great idea because what do I fill in? I fill in the blank now. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> that because. Sure. Uh, thank you for the question, Commissioner Nunez. Uh, affordable land dedication is a is a strategy that's mentioned in the precise plan uh, as a way to to hit the twenty percent. 
target. And it's also in the BMR ordinance. So we've always been trying to maximize the amount of affordable units and uh, provide the most deeply affordable, give the city control. There's the, I think the advantages have been laid out uh, at this point. So it was a strategy that we read about in the, the precise plan and as a way of trying to maximize the number of affordable units uh, started to, to emerge in our minds as probably the most fruitful strategy to maximize uh, those units. Cool. So then if, let's just say by the end of this whole process, the end result is that the project gets approved with the condition that uh, Google and Lendlease need to develop the 15% affordable, um, you know, with like dispersed amidst all of the uh, parcels of land, there is no land dedication because it sounds like that's only to the benefit of us. Um, if that's the end result, then you guys would be happy about that. Like would that work for you guys? I think if we're trying to maximize the amount of affordable units, I don't think that delivering uh, a lower percentage of inclusionary would would be meeting the city's goals. Um, right, that, that wasn't my just question. Out loud. question was, if we said theoretically under this scenario, hey, like if the city of Mountain View was personified and said, hey, like I don't, I want less affordable units. I want you guys to build less affordable units, but no land dedication. You build it inclusionary amidst all of the properties interspersed within, then you guys would be like happy about that. I'd be very surprised, I suppose, if that was this that became the city's right. direction. But that's, not, that's not my question. I'm asking, would that be a workable good outcome for Lendlease and Google? Um, it's not something we've looked at in a long time. So I don't know if that I could give a sort of a clear answer at this point. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Newman, uh, can, can I jump in? Uh, sorry, Chair sorry, Cranston. Uh, I, I might jump in on that. Just, just, I mean, I think it's a, in a hypothetical question, um, you know, Google is committed to providing as much affordable housing as we can, and we have an affordable housing fund that does such a thing and helps the creation of affordable housing because we do recognize that there is a housing crisis in the area right now. Um, so I, I think we would rather produce as much housing as possible. So I don't think we would be just as good with that solution in that hypothetical situation that, that was proposed there by Commissioner Nunez, but, um, you know, we would have to go back and look at it in, in detail. So in the staff report, Lindsay, and in the earlier study session, it was stated that inclusionary was was not financially viable. Are you saying that that was, you've not reassessed that since the previous study session? No, I, I recall those discussions at the, um, at the session, and we did, we did look at it. I think we reconfirmed that it's not economically viable to get anywhere close to the number of units that the land dedication strategy um, provides. And given that the land dedication strategy was, uh, if I'm recalling correctly, broadly supported by the EPC back in February 2021, um, confirming, you know, as we as we did that we were not going to come anywhere close to that with inclusionary. We've kind of haven't looked at it very much since then. Uh, and when the council supported that as an option as well, correct? The 20% land education. Yeah, so the direction that uh, council provided was definitely to move forward in looking at it and studying it further. Um, and so here we are at this point, having studied it and come to a conclusion. Okay, any other commissioner questions before we move to public comment? Commissioner Hammeyer. Just briefly, and maybe this is a question for staff. So I think the housing piece in the first phase is included in the housing element um, pipeline. So if this is approved, those pipeline projects become actually, like that helps us 
gain compliance. Is that right? But if, if for whatever reason, based on what Commissioner Clark had said earlier, like the different, the different layouts and configurations, it's possible that we could have a reduced number than what we're planning to tell the state for this coming housing element cycle. Is that right? Uh, correct. So it was assumed that the affordable housing sites and the phase one residential, the R1 and R2, uh, would be um, implemented during the time span of that housing cycle. So, um, so yeah, that's what we've assumed in the draft housing element. Thank you. Vice Chair Yen. Thank you. Um, First, a couple of questions that are a little bit unrelated um, to what we've already discussed. I'll, I'll say this first. Um, one is the active uses on the ground floor or around the residential buildings um, in, in the park. I, I, I think I reread in the precise plan that general office is allowed as the ground floor use. I know that you guys had stated you're really trying to get neighborhood uh, services in. and and, and I, I believe that you're you're going to work in good faith towards that. But since you know we're looking at a long time period, we don't know what may happen, and we understand that sometimes general office is just easier to lease out. So if that's the case, does that count towards the jobs housing balance, and does it come out of the the two million that has been approved? Um, I just, I'm wondering how that works with all the numbers that we've been looking at, including the um, affordable housing in that case, because it comes after the fact. So it's just a question. Yeah, so I think um, the $2 million uh, square foot um, development reserve is all associated uh, specifically with the net new office development. It is not presumed or to include sort of the smaller offices that I think you're referring to that are allowed in neighborhood commercial areas. Um, but there is sort of a square footage limit to those spaces um, for those permitted office uses. Um, but it wouldn't uh, be something that would be deducted from the development reserve. Um, I think part of what is important to remember is any space that's participating in this small business program that they have as a community benefit has to fit very specific parameters. So any tenant that goes into those spaces would have to meet those qualifications. And really the way those are set up, and Martin or Jeff, feel free to chime in, but I don't really think of most office users would really qualify for that small business um, program. They'd be a really small office for starters. Uh, the only thing I can think of that might show up is if a nonprofit is looking for a small amount of office space. And we, you know, that's the only thing I can think of. And hopefully in that case, it's a nonprofit that um, has some sort of operation that can spill out into the plaza, into the park a little bit. If it was a nonprofit bike repair, making that up. Uh, uh, and they had some office space and they also spilled out and did bike repair lessons um, in the park. That might be an affinity, you know, sort of an affinity in terms of matching the tenant to the space they participate in the program, uh, and then there, there could be some small amount of general office, but that's not generally what the program's designed to do. And yeah, I agree with you, Lindsay. I don't think it would, you wouldn't really have anyone that would even fit the criteria. So, so for instance, there wouldn't be an R and D firm that you know was associated or just you know tied in well with what's already going there. Um, going in for office space. It is its own entity, but you know, also tech and has office and it comes in, it's just small. Um, it functions in theory and practice as office. That wouldn't qualify, you're saying, in the program. I think R&D is a, Lindsay, is that a different land use? I think I saw that. R&D sounds yeah. like a land use that's subject to the development reserve. And so the master plan doesn't contemplate that land use in, in active use. I, I can imagine a small maker space, um, a, a small, some, but again, they would have to be, they would have to meet the criteria. Um, and so it, it, it sounds, it still seems very much like an outside, an outside chance. And R&D firm, I think is, Again, just sounds to me like a different land use that's not contemplated within the, the program. 
Yeah, and I think one thing, um, Commissioner Yen, is um, really if it's a, an allowed land use that's currently allowed in that area, then it is a use that could go into these ground floor commercial spaces with the exception of those that qualify are part of this program, which will be much more tailored, you know, to the specific parameters for that. So I think, um, I think to your point, I can't definitively say that there won't be some kind of small or office use that goes into a ground floor space at some point if this development is built out, but um, it's really comes down to what the precise plan allows today. Right, and I guess that's, that is the crux of my question is that in the precise plan, it allows for R&D, it allows for general office. And I know, I just didn't know, is the 50,000 square foot that is part of the program, those parameters cover the entire 50,000 square feet that has to be, so they have to meet parameters of the program in order to be considered active use within the 50,000 square feet. Um, that so the, anything in the precise plan can go into those active uses and it can be R and D general office. Um, so yeah, I think anything that's in the precise plan, that's an allowable use can be proposed. I think of the 50,000, um, Google's program is targeted at 21,000 of those 50,000 square feet is participating in that program, which may not qualify for a typical office use. Um, so there are other square footage where potentially that could happen. What I will say is that the master plan attempts to lay out sort of the intention of the land uses that are preferred mm -hmm. um, by listing, uh, I think they have a table in there of active uses in the implementation chapter um, that are really geared towards more of these services and retail and entertainment type uses that I think um, Google and Lundley's have kind of identified as their preferred um, tenants. Oh yeah, I'm I'm sure it's preferred. I'm just wondering. So the program only covers twenty thousand. There's fifty thousand laid out in the master plan. So that's a potential thirty thousand that could be office that is not tied to the jobs housing link, or any of the other requirements and numbers that we're um, looking at now. Yeah, so it's twenty one thousand square feet of their program. Then there's five thousand square feet that the city requires in the precise plan to be neighborhood commercial uses. Okay. And then outside of that, what does that leave? <laughs> Um, 4, yeah, 24,000 that, uh, in theory, yeah, could yeah. be using the precise plan. Cause I was yeah. just thinking 24,000, if 1000 square feet is three affordable units, that's 24 times three affordable units. It's like almost, I can't do math 75, almost 75. I can only round up, <laughs> um, affordable units that we, you know, are not getting. Yeah, with the way the program is set up. Yeah. I think that's something we should look at um, before it goes to council. It's something to discuss. Um, Any other questions or? Uh, let me think. I'm sorry. I have a, my notes here. The, you know, very small question. I know there's 24 seven access to get to the bridge through Ellis Park. Um, so that's fabulous. But then the park itself has limited hours. I'm assuming that's just like a regular park. You're not going to put gates around the pathways and limit access that way. It's just sort of, it's known that when it's a certain time, you're not supposed to be there. Correct. Okay, great. I will say though, with a ped bike bridge, there might be a slightly different situation uh, oh, because okay. again, we wouldn't gate off the bridge. So we would likely have some kind of lighting or something to allow um, nighttime use. Okay. Oh, I was just wondering through Ellis Park, it's not that the pathway is going to be gated off Correct. from the side parks. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Yes. Thanks. That's it for now. I'll leave the rest to discussion. Okay. Um, so we'll move into public comment. Um, would any member of the public on the line like to provide comment on this item? If so, please click the raise hand button in Zoom. We'll press star nine on your phone. Phone users can mute and unmute themselves with star six. The EPC clerk will start the timer and let you know when your time is up. Um, can I get, can folks who are interested in speaking, please do a quick, put your hand up so you have a feel for how many we're looking at here. Nine. Um, so we can, we can probably keep it at, all right, keep it at three minutes. 
Jerry Simparpio. Um, one second. Yes, hello? Yes, uh, one second. I'm up, and then we're sure to have you to start. All right, Jerry, you can speak now. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Jerry Santarpia. I am a representative of the North Cal Carpenters Union, and we come out in full support of this project. This project will give um, local hire. So people who usually got to travel two hours in one way will now be able to work where they live, which is actually great for the community because their tax base will stay there. It's great for their families because they'll have more time to stay at home with them. Also, being that it's a union project, it'll have apprenticeship programs, which we all know is a major escalator for uh, middle class mobility. Um, also, it is um, documented that 90 percent of apprentices are people of color so that will also help for equality and, and equity so we come out in full support of this project and thank you very much thank you for Christian. all right i'm promoting sean reese to start um should be able to speak uh now Good evening, Chair and Commissioners. My name is Sean Reese. I'm a field representative with the NorCal Carpenters Union, Local 405. We are in full support of the Middlefield Park Master Plan. This plan will create thousands of construction jobs for the community and it will provide economic opportunity and tax revenue to the city, county, and school districts. It will help alleviate the housing crisis and give the community more housing opportunities by creating 19,000 units. I would like to point out and applaud the collaboration between Google and the City of Mountain View. In closing, the Carpenters support this project for the benefits it will provide to the community. We appreciate your investment to the community and thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, I'm um, promoting Bruce England. One second, Bruce. I think I'm on, you hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you all. Thanks, commissioners. This has been a really very deep uh, and detail uh, conversation on your part, even just in the questions phase. So I'm going to have to actually listen to it again to catch all the details and your subsequent discussion. I just want to highlight the letter that Mountain View Coalition for Sustainable Planning wrote, and I'm speaking on behalf of the coalition. Uh, Cliff Chambers might be speaking later about some of the details in the letter, but we get into, as Commissioner Clark said, some of the details around um, the housing count, affordable and inclusionary housing is very important. Um, and also the cost sharing and how that's all going to work and when that part will be considered, whether it's during this phase with EPC and city council or at a later time. Um, this is going to come up more in the design phase, but um, if there are any retail outlets that are going to be used for grocery or produce, they need to be big enough to have landing areas and storage areas. So if that needs to wait for the design phase, fine. But if it needs to be anticipated, maybe that should be thought through. Um, on the trails and lighting, the commissioner, Ian, uh, brought up a moment ago, um, the, the way that lighting is handled has to be done very carefully because it can't be so bright that it has impact on, on wildlife, but it also needs to be safe enough for pedestrians and bicyclists that will inevitably use the facilities. And lastly, MVCSP has long supported local hire and fair labor practices. So we'll just throw our support behind that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bruce. Uh, Bruce England mentioned I'm with the Mountain View Coalition for Sustainable Planning. And we've had the opportunity, um, think to many sessions hosted by Google Lendlease to provide input, and we really appreciate that. We have expressed and now really continue to express strong support for the overall mixed use development uh, framework provided in the master plan. As we did participate back in 2021 in the uh, study sessions. 
And I, I really feel that staff and the applicant did an, an exemplary job of addressing many of the issues that were discussed at that time. We're particularly pleased with the outcome of the phasing plan. There's a lot of front loading of the, the uh, housing, community benefits, the um, you know, the parks network, et cetera. And what you haven't really mentioned a great deal about is the small uh, business diversification and nonprofit inclusion program, which we think feel is really a, a great community asset. And the other thing that really wasn't talked much about is the kind of some, some of the really good design features that have resulted from the design by uh, the applicant, but, but also in terms of really having a really good urban design, it really fits together. And I think, you know, there's a lot of very good things about this overall project. Like you, we've had a lot of concerns about whether or not the actual delivery of the affordable housing units as part of the master plan will actually be realized. And you've had a lot of good discussion about that. And I won't repeat that, but there are a couple of questions that really I do have after that is, there's a big difference whether the city has a contribution or not. If they don't have a contribution in 2021 dollars, it's 63.7 to 80.6 million dollars of financing required compared to just 22.5 to 39.4 million with the city contribution. And we really need to understand why. We really hope that we do have the full um, 380 units and we'd really like to know if there's going to be a city contribution we'd really like to, you to ask the city to make a commitment for the city contribution because it makes a huge difference in terms of the the city financing and i think you know in close in closing we're very pleased with overall master plan i think it's going to be a jewel for the city and we strongly support it but if if you're not able to realize the 380 units there really should be a contingency plan for that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Speaker, Christian. Okay, um, Beth Fisher. Hello, yes, this is Beth Fisher. I'm from the Santa Clara and San Benito counties Building and Construction Trades Council, and we fully support this project. Uh, not only is there the opportunity to open up thousands of construction jobs for the region's skilled union workforce with prevailing wages to support working families, um, but we also appreciate the affordable housing to really try to meet the housing crisis um, in Mountain View. In addition, um, the opportunities for uh, small businesses, nonprofits, and of course, support services um, for residents, uh, the new retail and so forth could support jobs um, and many other job opportunities um, at the site. Um, so we really support this plan and we're excited to see this development. Yeah. Hi, yes, thank you, council member. My name is Sharon Denoa, and I am a resident at Mountain View. And I just had a few questions. I appreciate the questions around um, current residents and the traffic as well as the pollution that it's going to cause. My concern is I'm concerned about the power load that this is going to offer. We typically have outages frequently, and I'm concerned about it. Another concern I have is that it sounds to me that they have both office and housing. And although they have committed to using union labor, I'm also wanting to know if that's for the entirety of their project and if that this labor is gonna be local labor to um, the source of it is going to be local to ensure that there is no exploitation of labor on the project. I'm also concerned about whether it is modular construction or if this is gonna be on-site construction based upon quality and the duration, as I know that modular has been something that's been popular, but that the quality is low quality. Um, those are pretty much my questions. Um, also, that I hope that the hours of construction can be limited to day hours so that it is not disturbing the residents further. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Speaker. 
Ronnie Fisher. Hello, my name is Ronnie Fisher, and I represent the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. We appreciate your plans, especially the aggregation of open space areas, creating habitat corridors with native species, plants, green spaces with a significant breaking up a little bit right? light pollution to protect birds. We plan to follow the project as it is implemented, delivering a mixed use project that truly weaves nature into the urban landscape. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker. Kenneth Javier Rosales. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, great. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Cranston, Vice Chair Joyce, and Commissioners. My name is Kenneth Javier Rosales, and I'm the Planning Senior Associate with SV at Home, a nonprofit, or <clears throat> nonprofit organization that advocates for affordable housing across Santa Clara County. Um, we would like to thank staff and City Council for their diligent work and leadership to bring the vision of the East Wisman area into full fruition through the Middlefield Park Master Plan. Um, as discussed in our letter submitted to you today, we are in strong support of staff uh, and the Google Lend Lease team's proposal for Middlefield Park. It lays out a plan to completely transform the current swath of suburban style office parks and parking lots into a vibrant, well-connected neighborhood, rich in places for people to, of all incomes to income levels to enjoy, such as parks, shops, and transit. Um, and we are most pleased that the Middlefield Park Master Plan enables 20% of new units to be 100% deed restricted affordable homes through land dedications, enabling the full 20% that will come to the city with valuable site improvements. Middlefield Park will play a significant role in the growth of Mountain View in the next decade as it feeds into the city's housing element arena obligations. We are confident that all parties, including the city council, are committed to actualizing the vision of Middlefield Park, and we are excited about its role in taking the next step to implementing the East Wisman Precise Plan. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Okay. Next speaker. Um, Alex Brown. Hey, friends. Uh, I'll keep it quick. Yay for more housing. Yay for trees. Uh, um, the land use looks good, but when it comes to design, Jeff, come on. You got this. Make it weird. Give me something interesting to look at. Give me something fun to go visit. Thanks. Thank you. Any other speakers? I'm seeing no other speaker. Yeah. All right. Then we will bring it back to the commission uh, for deliber deliberation and action. Um, would like to go first. Commissioner Gutierrez. Thank you. Hey, uh, everyone moves around so much on the screens. Vice Chair Yen, I had a quick question for you. So you mentioned that you wanted to explore more of the potential of an additional, I don't know, 30 something or 40 something housing affordable units before we moved on. Did I understand you correctly in your last question or? Um, I had brought up the idea that in the precise plan, it allows for general office use to be on the ground floor, which um, in the master plan, it's proposed as active use. So if that is general office, and um, so Lendlease and Google had said that within their program, that kind of thing is not encouraged. And I, I believe they are really trying to get neighborhood services in, but their program encompasses only 20,000 out of 50,000 of what is active use. So if what doesn't qualify in their program for the 20,000, can then go into the 30,000. I'm sure that's not their intention, but you know, 
we know okay. that sometimes over time things can change and it's allowed then and in that case we are getting maybe oh i'm sorry what was it 24,000 square feet extra of office space that does not get accounted in our jobs housing linkage and all the other sort of numbers that we're looking at but that's the one i was um focusing on so okay. i didn't know if there was um something that we could uh, talk to uh google and lindley's about or the city could uh, to figure out what happens in that case all right so perfect so so having understood your point on that i guess my question then is with the current recommendations would you want to amend to include this question that you have so that council can look at it or how would you propose that question to be explored well i would love for this to go uh, to be discussed first among us to find out what you guys think and um personally I, I do think it's something that um, council should also look at so if that's the only way is to vote and put it as a conditional okay because when you had brought that up i started thinking about it from that perspective because i hadn't before and when i looked at the studies i, I had some questions but what i had seen there that item based on how you explored it and explained it i didn't see a remedy for it so I'm with you. I support your question in terms of, well, how does this work? Um, so you have someone else on your side to explore that perspective. But that's all I have right now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm happy to hear what everyone else has to say in regards, because we'll probably have to vote on that. Mr. Clark? Yeah, I can go. So I um, sort of looking at this holistically, I I, I know um, you, this all sort of came to fruition after I left council, but I know we were really excited about you know the precise plan that we put in place and the, the, the potential for these master plans to come through, which would assemble a number of parcels and be able to provide the neighborhood a lot of the, um, I think the key elements that um, we'd hope would come to fruition for the precise plan um, in specific areas instead of it all happening in piecemeal over <clears throat> some number of, of decades through, through different property owners and, um, and different concepts that might not um, be fully planned out in advance like you would get with a, with a master planning process. And so um, when I had, for, I, so I'll just focus on what my initial high level concerns were and, and how they were addressed and where my concerns lie today. Um, I think most of my initial concerns, uh, you know, from um, a, a year, um, a year or so ago, well, actually two years ago, um, were, have, have been allayed somewhat. I was very concerned about the 20 year DA um, just because you know, that's really not, um, I wouldn't say standard, it's just something we haven't done before. And 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 part of that is that we just haven't had um, um, something with an assemblage this large um, with all the elements. And so uh, what I'm what I'm pleased with is is the work that's been done to adjust the phasing. So that was the other sort of big um, concern that I had as part of a, a 20 year DA was that if you phase this in such a way uh, or in a in a suboptimal way, you end up with um, certain elements that may or may not get get built. And so, one of the things that we really wanted to make sure that we had, uh, or at least one of the things that is important to me, is to get some of the housing and the community benefits up front. Some of the 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 open space, the the green space, the connectivity, the um, the affordable housing, and the um, and market rate housing as well, um, especially uh, in that area, as we've seen, we've approved some other projects that have, are currently sitting on the shelf and may not happen. And so um, this is, I think, uh, another opportunity to, to start to move those things forward in a way that um, <clears throat> is compliant with the precise plan and, and meets a lot of a lot of those goals. So I think my, my general concerns about the the long length of the DA have, have mostly been addressed. My bigger concerns with the phasing have mostly been um, addressed by what's been proposed. I um, I always go back and forth between inclusionary units and land um, because um, you know they both have their their benefits and drawbacks, and it really comes down to I think the 
the the site, the context, and all the things around it as to whether or not the land is um, is more valuable than than the inclusionary units. And I think in this case, um, you know, we uh, the I think the the city very deliberately wrote in you know the the alternative mitigations or the alternative uh, of land dedication. Uh, as long as it can provide you know an equal or greater benefit um, than the inclusionary, and I think in this particular market environment um, and the long length of this DA, having the certainty of having that land dedicated upfront um, provides a pretty you know decent value to the city, and as opposed to um, the inclusionary units, um, just because we as the city will have the ability to to um, you know, move on that site whenever we feel it's most appropriate. Um, and I think, um, and we have the ability to select the unit mix. We have the ability to partner with uh, a developer that we uh, we want and design it the way that we want. And, and it may take a long time um, and it may cost a lot of money, but we, we have the ability to select, you know, where we get the funding from, how much we put in, um, how we design that site and, and, and how it all fits together. Um, so those are those are the, the phasing, the DA, um, and ultimately the the layout of the the different spaces, which uh, I know there were initial concerns about a couple of years ago in some of the study sessions. I think all of those have been addressed, and it it looks like a, a site that um, or an overall plan that really fits. My hope is that it all uh, obviously I'd like it all to come to fruition, but in terms of phasing, getting the housing up front, phase two, which includes some other community benefits, is. A big chunk of the office, um, which I think is a, a good incentive um, for um, for this to get built, because office uh, will will have some value there. Um, and then that the remainder of that office is in phase four, so that provides some encouragement for phase three to occur too. So I think overall, it generally um, it's come together quite well. Uh, you know, I still have some concerns about the the DA, obviously, and and hoping that this all comes to fruition and that we don't get stuck partway through, but um, I, I think it will be hard to find another plan that's been put together and uh, uh, a, a consortium or a, or a team behind this with Lendlease and Google that, that can pull this off, frankly. Um, they're not the only one, but they're one of the few. So um, overall, I have a lot of confidence uh, in, in this master plan concept and the way that it's come together. I think, um, for me, the other part of being an EPC member is I, you know, I always pay attention to any uh, the EIR and any um, you know statements of overriding considerations and um, and things like that because that is um, really important for us to look at. And and the key here is looking at what caused this, um, why is it being caused, and um, and do the benefits outweigh the the cost? And and I think it's been touched upon earlier, especially in the questions. You know, we're really looking at the um, you know, the 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 log project and the combination of things and the barrier quality management districts um, um, uh, uh, rules where we're, we're sort of looking at a cumulative impact and I think the mitig mitigations associated with those that have been identified um, should um, should um, at least give me uh, uh, some solace and um, and I believe ultimately that those can be um appropriately mitigated um maybe not to the point of not um triggering overriding considerations but i feel comfortable recommending that we we do that in this particular case so um overall I, the ground floor re um the ground floor um commercial space i understand the concern but i you know i work for a small company our, our one of our floor plate like one level is 24,000 square feet, that's really not a lot of office in the grand scheme of things. It's, it's you know, I, I'm look parking back to walking the space today and it, it's just, if we were talking about 100,000 square feet um, or something like that, then I would be much more um, concerned, but I I don't necessarily share the same concern about, you know, 20 to 25,000 square feet of, of commercial space, especially on the, on the ground floor where that's likely going to be broken up, and the and the um, the uses for those are probably going to be pretty small. And it will be good to have not just uh, it'll be great to have retail and neighborhood serving um, services, but some of those services can also be commercial in nature as well. And so I think I think overall, what's proposed um, 
uh, works quite well. Um, I'm not sure, um, uh, you know, if if we want to to flag it as something for for council to consider. Um, I think that's fine. I'm not sure, like saying that it should be housing instead is the right um, is the right approach. Maybe it could be something else, but I I just don't. Um, I guess the bottom line is I'm just not that worried about that that amount of square footage. Uh, if it were three times that, I'd be much more worried. So. Uh, in any event, I'm prepared to support the staff recommendation when folks are ready. Um, I don't. Uh, there's there's nothing in my mind that that requires um, you know a significant change or deviation from um, from what's been put together after numerous community meetings and and study sessions between both EPC and council. So I'll stop talking. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Nunez. Uh, Vice Chair, you and I, your your hands left up from before. Or do you, uh, your hands have been up the whole time. Are you still? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Gutierrez had raised his hand first and he asked me a question, so I answered it, but I didn't take my turn. I oh, guess. Okay. But he had already started okay. that. Um, I was just going to say that, um, you know, we didn't talk about it. Obviously, Google and Lendley's have done a lot of work, and if I were to sing the praises of this master plan, we'd be here all night. Um, so I think they're very aware of all the, the positives, and it's testament to all their community outreach, and staff has worked very hard on this. It's, it's testament to all that work, and also the community activists, um, that everyone is supporting this um, in general. So what we're discussing now is just brass tacks, because um, I, I really, you know, take this job seriously. We're here to, as the voice of the, the the city, the community, and I do want to ensure that the win-win is truly a win for Mountain View. And um, I, I know that Commissioner Clark wasn't worried about, you know, the 20, I forgot, 26, 24,000 okay. square feet, but if we're looking at jobs housing linkage, it doesn't matter how small it is, if it's general office, we should be getting like almost you know 75 more affordable units i'm not saying you know i i don't want any other kind of use there other than neighborhood serving retail that's not what i'm saying i'm just saying if in the case that we're getting general office should we not be looking at applying the job housing linkage to that general office as well so that's really the point of that conversation um, and then the only point i have in addition to that is the is back to like my first question um to staff about asking the affordable housing people what their thoughts were on developing out the affordable housing units and i am very appreciative that chair cranston had gone ahead and took another step and actually personally asked someone so but irrespective of the cost the inflation and all that because it seems like the consultant did consult affordable housing developers is whether or not the alternative mitigation is equal or greater in value to actually getting what the city stated, which is the inclusive units. Now I understand that the inclusive units are not feasible. So when we look at that alternative mitigation, we're looking at you know, what it is um, as being appropriate. Pardon me. So if the job housing linkage is the number of units per thousand square feet, we're aiming for 380. It doesn't say what kind of units, unfortunately, if Michaela had said the demand is for two and three bedrooms, but the affordable housing developers are saying, if we look at two and three bedrooms, we are not going to get the 380, then are we getting equal or greater value? If inclusive units are not doable, then what else can we be gaining as a city in order to get the 380 units that the jobs housing linkage states we need. You see what I mean? I'm not sure. It was a whole long sentence paragraph there, but the main point is 
we need to get 380 units. That's what the jobs housing linkage says for affordable housing. If the demand is two and three bedrooms, why are we not getting 380 with a mix of the appropriate two and three bedroom units? Why are we settling for a bunch of studios and less than what the precise plan says, at least for, that's, that's market rate, right? maybe that's a different conversation, but in general, that's the mix the city wants. So why are we not asking for that? And can we get that on these two sites? 380 units of what is in demand. That's all. Okay. <laughs> I'm lowering my hand. Yeah, I mean, things I like about this, I like the labor union. Um, I like transforming, you know, like non-optimized parcels of land into arguably something better. Um, like the park amenities, um, that works for me. Um, I guess it's not a, you know, it wouldn't be hard for anyone to guess <clears throat> that my biggest concern with all of this is the alternative mitigation um from multiple or a, a few angles um number one being i i, I just want to be clear i think was this someone from silicon valley at home might have mentioned you know we're getting like 20 percent or something like that and and it'd be great to support because of that i like I want to be clear, we're not getting 20% units. We're getting land. We're getting land with the potential, the potential for that to become 20% inclusionary. And the thing I think about is what is the value of that land? And 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 to whom is that value corresponding to with regards to the choices that we as a body and then the city council goes on to make because land has multiple ways of being valuable right you can use it for agriculture you can hold it as an asset or you can use it for housing and if our purpose is to find ways to tend to the general welfare and well-being of the people in our community and if the most urgent need of our people and residents is the creation of more housing, in particular, more affordable housing, in particular, affordable housing that can house families in two or three bedroom units, and we're talking about potentially holding on to that and maybe developing it when we have more sunny economic conditions. I'm 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 not really in agreement with that. Um, you know, maybe I'm around the wrong kind of developers, but one of the word what the the top word that I've heard the most around the developers I've been around is risk, 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 risk. risk. Sorry, Seafull consultant. Uh, you hear me saying risk again. I'm sorry, but it's 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 a lot of risk in good times to be in the development business. And right now, what I'm hearing we're going to get is land and labor costs associated with all of the planning and procurement, the RFP. We have stretched out staff already. And the affordable developer themselves have risk that we're not even aware of. And so right now, what I'm hearing is, and what I'm feeling and seeing is there's maybe three options. One is we go with the alternative mitigation and we go with what the applicant is proposing and maybe in the future, 
I honestly, if if by the time phase one or phase two are done and we don't have those units, I, I think that's a failure, um, if not by phase one. Um, I'm honestly worried that we will just say, yeah, let's do alternative mitigation. And at the end of this, you know, 10 years down the line, 15 years down the line, honestly, hopefully not 20 years from now, that there's no units there, no affordable units or something subpar. Maybe we even had to sell the land because we actually couldn't find a way to develop it. Maybe we had to settle for less than the 380 units because that's all that we could do given all the conditions and circumstances at that time. And so that's something that in terms of understanding what's the likelihood of that happening, I'm not saying those are the most likely outcomes, but we don't know what the potential likelihood of that happening is. We don't have that risk assessment in front of us to say, hey, here's the alternative mitigation and here's what could happen if you do accept it. It's all about the potential value. I love potential value. What's going to be a barrier for us to be able to access that? Furthermore, I'm really hoping that in terms of a almost like alternative to the alternative, what some might call a counter proposal, not necessarily to the applicant, but to the city decision makers, to the EPC, to the council. Hey, here's their alternative mitigation. Here's another alternative that could work. Maybe it's them doing the inclusionary at the 15%. And because we weighed what the risk is of this outcome versus this more certain outcome, maybe we get less units, but this one is more guaranteed. If Google is a titan of economy and Len Lease is the developer of the Sydney Opera House and the Petronas Towers in Malaysia. They know what they're doing, right? I don't understand why it would be a pain for them to develop less affordable units in an inclusionary manner. Because the truth is, we already have, you know, I heard Commissioner Clark say, hey, you know, we could decide whatever we want to do with, with these units in this like dedicated parcel. The truth is, as a city, we've already had and made many decisions in the past around what we want our city to look like. And that's why those regulations are already there. This is an alternative mitigation to the decisions that have already been put in place by the governing councils that have come before us. And so there's no reason why we can't just say, hey, let's actually go with that. But the truth is, I don't feel like I have enough information to actually be able to assess whether or not how to balance that risk. Um, so on, on, on that front, I feel like I'm flying blind. I'll say for personally, I would say, I think as a body, we're flying blind. Everyone can disagree with me if they want. Um, but that's something that I'm I'm really upset about. Um, and it's, it's it, and I don't know that it's necessarily on the applicant, um, which is, yeah. Um, but that, that's my thinking. Um, as far as the retail goes, I'm very much, um, you know, appreciative of Commissioner Yin's critical eye around the office space and whether or not that necessary, whether or not that does have to apply. Um, the jobs linkage has to, jobs housing linkage has to apply to that. Um, good catch. Um, I, I I support that kind of critical review. Um, but yeah, I, I just don't know. So um, I'm only one of seven. I'm gonna stop talking um, and hear what others have to have to say. Okay, Commissioner Hamer. Thank you. And, and I do wanna say that one of the things I most appreciate about serving on the EPC is this dialogue and working alongside colleagues who are so committed to the future Mountain View. And I also know a lot of hours have gone into the East Wisman Precise Plan, and I do echo Commissioner Clark's sentiment. I think this is getting closer to realizing the vision we wanted in East Wisman and um, really linking office and residential development. Um, I think I'm the planning commissioner who lives the closest to this project and, and the master plan, and I'm just really excited with the direction that it's going. Um, it's not a perfect project. I, I really believe that this work is about trade-offs and, and we have to wrestle with some of these things that aren't exactly ideal. Um, I am comfortable with land dedication. I think um, affordable housing financing is extremely complex and far exceeds my my knowledge and despite many hours I've spent trying to understand it. And so um, I, 
I think that the flexibility it affords for us to, as a city, to be able to say, we have this land, we can work with an affordable housing developer, we can understand what the need is and where um, the funding landscape, what that looks like, because it is constantly changing. And I, I would really want to be informed and um, better understand where the affordable housing developer community is coming at and what they know um, and, and where the city's funding ability lies, because I think that uncertainty um, gives me a lot of pause, but I think um, the opportunity to build out this vision and have two parcels dedicated for affordable housing to be developed in a way that we see fit and can advise down the road, um, that am ameliorates my concerns. Um, a couple things that haven't come up tonight, and I, I did just want to flag, we haven't talked as much about mo um, mobility through the project. And I, I do think that there, um, there's some concerns raised about the traffic congestion around 101 in Ellis that just cannot be addressed given a host of reasons. And I think um, a lot of this project hinges on VTA, right, and getting more people to use this highly underutilized station at the moment. And so I, I just want to be careful that we're going into this knowing that a lot of this depends on getting more people in public transit and BTA is a critical partner in that and, and really getting people to to want to live a, a car light um kind of lifestyle in this in this new area that we're building. And then the last thing that I'll say related to the broader um, East Wisman precise plan, there's there's a hope, right, to um, develop the village centers on um, Middlefield and Wisman, and I would encourage the applicant to think about in their business program, where is their opportunity really for staging? So as, as that area maybe gets redeveloped, are there opportunities to think about some of the local neighborhood serving businesses that exist in this area and allow them, you know, write a first refusal or, or give them the first kind of offer to be considered for some of the, the ground floor retail um, space that we've been talking about. So um, like Commissioner Clark, I, I will plan to support this project, but I, I want to hear from others about how we can make it better. Commissioner Dempsey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I should comment on kind of the two the the, the two big points of discussion tonight. Um, very simply, I would say that I, I I I'm curious about the issue that Vice Chair Yen raised, um, and I would uh, I would welcome either now or later staff going back and kind of re-examining whether that calculation was done fully correctly because of the office space that didn't get counted, and perhaps I didn't catch the issue well enough. I didn't um, I didn't catch it the first time, so maybe I'm just confused about it, but if that if that ought that fifty thousand that we were talking about if some part of that wasn't counted in the linkage i'd like to know why so anyway i would support sort of a re-examination and maybe a uh, re-explanation of how that how that was done on the question of the alternative mitigation i think um consistency matters so two year year and a half ago i guess it was uh, i was very much in support of the idea of us going the route of taking the land because it it appeared to let us have more units in total. And at the time, we were big fans of as much as we could get. Let's do it. Um, and this, as I understood it, got us more units going with the the land thing. I understand the the fear that comes with you know a looming recession. I totally get it. I get it too. I don't I don't, I don't get the impression that there's a lot of um, certainty in building huge buildings like this. But as long as staff can look us all in the eye and say that they feel, you know, that it, it's built into the, it's going to get built into the budget. And this is the kind of thing that's been done before. It's not an outrageous outlay of money that we, the city of Mountain View has never done before. I mean, if they could look at us and tell us, yeah, okay, no, this is doable. This isn't crazy. This is something that we can do. That's, I value that. I value that. I value staff's support of the concept. I value very much the community support of the concept. You know, we heard from, uh, we heard from carpenters and and uh, sustainable, like I, we've got that laundry list of folks that showed up to say, there's so many things that we like about this project. And and I didn't hear a lot of um, fear about doing the land dedication. It is more work for sure. And it is more risk on the city for sure. And, and again, I'm going to be looking at this because I don't build buildings. I'm going to be looking to city staff to tell us in no uncertain terms that this is not an unduly risky proposal. And I mean that, like, I really would like to hear at some point, just so that I can sleep at night, tell me, 
This is not an unduly risky thing to do. Um, but from all of the evidence I've seen, it is not. And that's good enough for me to stick with my, you know, what I voted on a year and a half ago and say, I am okay going forward with this project and with the alternative mitigation. Um, yeah, I may have a couple more comments at the end because uh, I didn't get to talk about all the stuff I love about this project, um, but I'll leave it there. Um, Thank you, Chair. Well, first of all, I haven't been a former member of the Mountain View Wisman School Board. I can tell you negotiating with Google is tough. And more often than not, we got jack shit. That's as simple as that. I'm sorry. Truth be told, man. It's it's a long, drawn-out process. I can't tell you how many times you promised a school site. That went out the door in all my five years there, and then two years since then. Now the conversation steered towards them directly discussing this issue with the city for credits. That's how it goes. So to have something like this go through this process for a number of years and then come back with an actual proposal and an intent to develop is news to me. And I appreciate that because you had various community inputs in general, not just from uh, the city of Mountain View, but among our member uh, fellow citizens, which is wonderful. So uh, we're not adverse to risk. I wasn't uh, part of a board that was uh, cautious, but nor were we reckless. So I know I can ask a question and I can ask something of a question to Eric or perhaps even Sandy Lee if she's, and I think she's still here. When I went through some of these sessions with Google and negotiating and tactics and also just negotiating good faith, for the most part, sometimes we wouldn't have a risk assessment depending on the subject matter. But here now that we're dealing with this land mass and land transfer development and potential development for affordable housing, uh, is, is, it, is it customary to have a risk assessment also associated to the potentiality of this working or not in such a project, Eric? Is this how it works through the city or is that something that comes later on or does that even come into play? Uh, thanks for the question, Commissioner. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say that we're, um, we're walking new ground in a lot of ways for this project. I know we've done um, uh, some discussion around site dedication for other um, other projects in the past. Um, maybe I'll tee this up to Lindsay and see kind of as as you were evaluating this uh, site dedication process. Um, what what have you you know what? What other experience, whether it's in, in Mountain View or other cities, I mean, you know, we work with a lot of consultants that work with a lot of other cities. Um, and, and how has that kind of informed the process and this question of risk assessment, um, how has it come up in the discussion for this project? Yeah, so I think a couple things. Um, we had one, a project to dedicate land in North Bayshore. That was the Sobrato project. Um, there was no kind of analysis like what we've done for this project for that one. So this really is quite honestly, the first time we've done an analysis of a land proposal like this, where we've looked at not just sort of all of the numerical information that we can, but also look at what could potentially be developed here and what kind of cost um, does that come at? So, um, you know, this is really a, a new territory for us. Um, and I think we've learned a lot from the city staff side of really um, how we could potentially, you know, modify our programs or other requirements to sort of address uh, some of these things we've learned along the way. In terms specifically to some kind of risk assessment, um, you know, I can't say that we've done uh, what would be classified as a risk assessment. Um, for I think what has been talked about here tonight. I think a lot of the work we're doing is assessing a private proposal and what does it mean to deliver something on that land. Um, we're definitely not the only city. We've talked to other cities that have done land dedication. San Jose is a good example. They've done quite a few land dedication projects. Um, and so we've talked to them uh, in this process and, and uh, I think a lot of us are all in the same boat in terms of trying to figure out 
what these mean, I think, um, and really what we've produced as part of this staff report and worked with the consultant team on um, is really our best, best efforts to date on trying to figure this out. Um, you know, I'll say openly and honestly, I can't say this may not be perfect, <laughs> but I think it's, it's really our best guess and approach to try to assess this. Um, and I think we're open as city staff to how we might be able to do uh, different analysis in the future or how we could consider different things in the future as well. Okay, great. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Lindsay. That helps out a lot because I think this is a, a, um, a movement in progress, right? And we're heading towards whatever we spoke about years past, whether I was on the school board or now with the EPC, it's all about the partnerships. You, you, you may sometimes ruffle some feathers, you, sometimes you don't, but you get to an end point that's a win-win for everyone as best as you can, as soon as you can, outweighing all the pros and cons. And, and right now, based on what I see from Google and what they've proposed, I can't see any fault to what they've suggested in doing. So I'll be supporting this. That's not an issue. I think the question now is, can we believe in our process to move forward? Can we believe in the city council to make the right choices after us? I think the answer is yes. Thank you. So, uh, Vice Chair, and I haven't had a chance to chime in. Is it would it be okay if I spoke for a moment? Okay. So, um, I had the I, I, at the last meeting. I suggested all of you go back and listen to the the study session that Michaela alluded to about the the council asked for on affordable housing, and I heard seven voices very committed to finding ways to get affordable housing in this city. I didn't hear, oh, we're going to put this off to some future point in time. It was staff figure out how do we do this and, and keep it moving. I also heard that based on the precise plan or the, the housing element and the things that have been brought forward, that we have the wonderful problem of potentially having more land owned by the city than than we've ever had before. So how do we go get the money to be able to do these kinds of things? So that's that's a great news. I mean, Artie, I, I know she's on the, she's been on the attendee list here all day, and she's actually listening. Uh, that her and her team, Michaela, did a great job in that session, and they did lay out a plan on how, you know, what do we need to do? There is no certainty. One of the first definitions I got of management was making decisions without, with incomplete information. So Commissioner Nunez, Welcome to the EPC, okay? We're not going to have all the answers. Um, that's what we have to deal with, quite frankly. I look at this and say, you know what? Google and Unleashed have listened. They made some changes. Would I love this to be, like Commissioner Clark, a, a six- or seven-year you know, uh, development agreement and get it all done that time? Absolutely. Um, but this is, I, quite frankly, I look at this, and anything that's been proposed in North Bayshore, I have far more confidence that this will happen than anything in North Bayshore, quite frankly. This, to me, looks like it's it has a lot of great potential. And I think Commissioner Clark made the, the comment earlier that things that were submitted before have fallen by the wayside. Well, guess what? We all saw and approved and council approved a development on Middlefield that's across the street from this. And guess what? It went before the DRC this week. It's back. 450 more units across the street from this. Okay, Loge has been approved. There's another project that's proposed right next to it. The potentials here for not only this, but another you know thousand plus units all in this area. So, to Chair Vice Chair Yim's concern about retail, I think we I would love to see a way of encouraging Lend Lease to do this to, to make sure that that space does become retail because you're going to have potentially before you're even finished, you're going to have that in place. The one thing that I didn't mention when I talked to my to my Part of a housing friend was, you know, what do you think of getting land? And his answer was, land is a really good thing. So it was the fact that we were getting the land. It, I didn't hear, I'm, I'm not going to go try to figure out how to get the money. It's like, if you have land, I can, you know, I'll, I'll try to figure something out. So I, 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 I understand the need is a value of potential risk assessment. That's actually a financial risk. Okay, if I'm going to get loan money from a bank, are you going to, be able to pay my bills? Are you going to, are you going to, are you going to make money for me? Well, that same kind of assessment doesn't happen as much in, in the nonprofit world. And so I think, you know, as the landowner, 
we're going to have the ability to go do that and, and pick a developer, put it out there and look for a proposal, just like we did with Lot 12, um, to be able to find something and make it work. So when it comes to the mix, Vice Chair Yin, we could say, I want the entire space to be one-bedroom units or single zone, and we'd probably get more than 380. We could probably make decisions say, I want everything to be three bedroom units, and we would never come, come close to 380. But you know what? It'll be our choice because we own the land. I do think that the that you know the stat the challenge that Michaela and and Wayne and Artie, you know, worked on to figure out. I think they may be you know they're going to have to look sharp in their pencil even more because uh, you know I, I'm, I'm it's going to take a while if we get all these big projects. But I think what Google's done is is a uh, it's a step in the right direction. It's not perfect. Um, I. I think it's, uh, it's the, the transformation that we all hope for in, in East Westman is starting. You know, hopefully it's, not, it's done before what I said earlier, 2042. <laughs> hopefully I'm still kicking in 2042, uh, but I think this is the step in the right direction. So I'm going to be supporting it. Uh, you know, it's not perfect, um, but I think it's a, I, I think it's a, it's a, a project worth supporting, and we'll we'll be recommending to, to council that we move it ahead. So uh, that's my speech. Nice Thanks. Um, yeah, I think I was one of the few commissioners who very early on really, really pushed for inclusionary and we didn't have enough information at the time. Now that we've got a little bit more information um, and not only is Google saying it's not feasible economically to do inclusionary, all inclusionary, and the consultant is saying it and staff agrees with the consultant. I'm happy to put aside the inclusionary i do see benefits a lot of benefits to the alternative mitigation of having the land so that is a plus that goes into is this alternative mitigation equal or greater there's something to put in the column that says yes this is something we can consider what i am i guess if i if i get want to get really specific the question would be then is the land dedication is that enough land to do the required number of units and what mix is that it is great we get to choose but the what we're choosing is limited to what that land can provide if we know the demand is two three bedroom units and that's where the money is that's where the demand is as Michaela had said then how many units can we get they're already saying it's going to be under the required so is this then equal? Is this land dedication equal or greater? So my question is, did we go to the affordable housing developers and say, hey, this is the demand. This is what is going to get us our financing. We, we need two, three bedrooms. We are required to get 380. Does this pass muster? And that question has not been answered for me personally. I don't know. It doesn't seem like it, given the information we've gotten. We're not going to get the 380 if we want two, three bedrooms. And all these other projects were saying, yeah, we really think families should live here. I think families should live here too. As great as this project is and this master plan, a lot of work has gone into it. But if we don't make this decision now, we're not going to have anything to discuss and negotiate. So now is the time to negotiate it. So I think council should really, I, I'm all for supporting the overall plan, certainly. Definitely. And honestly, I wouldn't even be looking at this. You know, we got the information on Friday. I just now looked at it. So I'm sorry, Jeff. Um, you know, when we had uh, had the online thing, I didn't have the information before me and I didn't, I don't want to, you know, feel like I'm sidetracking people or what is the term? Just, um, you know what I'm talking about. Anyways, so the main point is, does the land dedication provide for what is required and what is in demand? given what we know. Let's ask the affordable developers. So if in the meantime, I'm, I'm willing to vote yes, a big yes, if I know that we're getting what is at least required. The land dedication does offer some benefits, but are we getting what's required first? Are those land, are those benefits with the land dedication gonna surpass taking a cut of the number of units and how many units are we going to have to cut that's the question and i i don't have 
I don't feel confident that I have the answer to say I am 100% on board with being able to choose that we take all studios so that we can get our required number of affordable housing units. I think it should be, we should get some more information or city council should have that information in front of them before they vote. I would make that a condition. Commissioner Clark. Um, yeah, so just to address that, I, I totally understand the concern, but I think the analysis that was done, we don't have to have all studios yet 380. I think staff is typically very um, methodical when it comes to determining whether a benefit outweighs um, you know, what would normally be uh, standard. And we have uh, a consultant we hired telling us that you know, it's, it's reasonably equivalent or beyond we have staff telling us that they're comfortable with that analysis. And my understanding is the analysis was done on studios, one bedrooms and two bedrooms to, to look at um, you know, where we're getting at. And I could be wrong and someone can correct me if I am. But the other piece of this is that our requirements aren't as set in stone as provide us this number of units based on what today's market demand is because market demand shifts. You know, it could be by the time that we get this land and we identify an affordable housing developer who will work with us on it, the demand could be four bedrooms. Um, and and so I don't think that, I mean, there's a reason why there's no sentence in in the precise plan or the or you know in the requirements around this that says that well it has to match whatever the current market demand is because then also who are you asking what the demand is? It, it really. There's, there's demand for affordable housing in every category. And so it really comes down to a matter of, of a judgment call of one, you know, are we comfortable with the analysis that was done to provide equivalency or more here? And, um, and if not, then what's the alternative? I'm not sure like telling everyone to go start from scratch and find X number of additional square feet for affordable housing and land dedication is, the right way to proceed. So that, that's the other way that I analyze this is let's say I let's say that I'm convinced that we need a whole bunch of three bedrooms and we need enough land and space for nothing but two and three bedrooms. Um, that's going to require a lot of additional land. And I don't think it's fair to have gotten this far along in the process where we've sort of been saying, yes, we're on the right path at every stage. And then at the last minute say, well, we need two and three bedrooms. So go find a bunch of additional land to dedicate to us. And by the way, that changes the entire economics of the project, shifts things around and does all that. So if the question is, you know, can we clarify for council between now and their meeting, sort of what um, what the assumptions were for the, for the different analyses so that they have that information and they can decide, you know, whether they feel this is equivalent or better. Um, with additional information, I'm totally on board with that. I just don't want to, I'm, I'm just not on board with making, you know, adding a condition specifically to the, to the overall project that says that, you know, they have to find 380, um, you know, three bedroom units. If, if council decides that they can, but I think that's, that's their purview. And then the, the other thing that I wanted to say is I wanted to thank vice chair and for, for clarifying and my my complete misunderstanding of the 24,000 square feet and what you were getting at um now I told I think I, I think I get it now in terms of the calculation and, and in terms of the jobs housing linkage and I just wanted to give staff an opportunity maybe to um explain if they can or, or maybe this is for another day but um you know whether we could whether the precise plan even says that that um that um you know, the square footage of, of that nature, whether it's in the precise plan or the master plan would be required to be part of the job housing linkage, or if there's some exemption there that you relied on um, to where it would um, basically be changing the rules of the game on them to include that. Yeah, so um, the way that the job housing linkage program is structured, it's really meant to serve uh, and be related to, you know, a true office building that's constructed and that will always you know, be designed and used as an office building. I think the struggle with, um, I think what Commissioner Yin is getting at is uh, commercial tenant space is not a constant use. It can always change over time. 
So it's hard to assume that it will always be office if it did get an office tenant. Um, and so I think the way that this program was set up, it was not intended to cover any of the neighborhood commercial serving kind of commercial ground floor spaces um, because those spaces could really change over time. Um, so that's how the, the program was sort of structured. Okay, I understand now. So yeah, the, the concern would be, you know, if all of those morph into you know, general, you know, more office like environments, then we're probably not quite getting the, the job housing linkage that we, we should have, but in general, like ground floor commercial spaces put up on of those sizes typically don't support long term like office use, I guess is, is what I'm what I'm hearing. So okay. Well that that helps me at least. I'm not sure about others. Um, but I would be um, you know, just to to throw out an idea. I mean, if, if others want to um um to ask staff if you know between now and the council meeting if we can get more information about the inputs that were garnered for the um uh, or developed as or assumed as part of the uh, the analyses that the um, you know maybe Google and Lendlease did and and what our consultants did and um, especially assumptions around bedroom count and then be able to say to council like hey like you know we're we're supposed to get the equivalent of 380 units here's the configurations that looks like you know if they're all if you want mostly two and three bedrooms it's it's going to be a lesser unit count if it's you know, studios, one bedrooms, and maybe some two bedrooms, then you can get to 380 and then sort of let them decide, uh, give them more information basically about what they're making a decision on in term of, terms of equivalency or better. But I don't know if that would satisfy folks or not, but I'll let others time. Commissioner Nunez? Cool. Um, I guess uh, I, I actually do appreciate Commissioner Clark's last uh kind of comment around some transparency around the the unit mixture um i mean if we if we just think about the last developer asking for concessions they were asking for concessions to write like have more <laughs> studios and one bedrooms um and to be quite honest like if accepting this alternative mitigation is going to result in a mixture of housing stock units that are inadequately meeting the need of the people who demand affordable housing the most, um, which I think after going through our housing element procedures, um, I mean, it's clear it's families, um, working families needing these units. Um, then at least we ought to be transparent about saying, hey, we're going to have this many studios for this many working families. At the very least, we should be transparent about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I have no problem with um, accepting Commissioner Clark's uh, transparency proposal around the configuration type, but I also don't have a problem with Commissioner Yin's um, suggested requirement either. Um, because as much as like, you know, Chair Cranston, I appreciate your um, paraphrasing of my position. I'm not seeking, you know, like 100% understanding of everything that could theoretically and practically go wrong. Um, you know, I appreciate that you've done management and I have my own line of profession and doing an assessment of what could go wrong with your project is not trying to, you know, understand everything. It's called due diligence. And I appreciate very much that Lindsay mentioned, you know, hey, this is a new thing that we're trying. Um, and we we're consulting with other people, other cities in our region, um, and we're doing our best. To me, that sounds like due diligence. It doesn't mean that there's no room for iteration. Doesn't mean there's no room for improvement of a process and incorporation of learnings. I'm quite honestly very comforted by that um, because that's what we need because as land gets more scarce, as costs go up, we're gonna have to find more and new innovative and creative ways to do this. And so um, I will always be appreciative of um, an increasing trend towards sound and proper due diligence of what we have on the table, what would happen if we did nothing, 
and what other alternatives are. And that's just good practice. So um, that's where I stand. I could go with um, Commissioner Clark's position, and I also have absolutely no issue at all supporting the requirement as proposed by Commissioner Yin. Mr. Chair Yin? Oh, you're on mute. Thanks. I wanted to say thank you to Commissioner Clark for um, uh, supporting the, the question to staff which is, can we get more information? Because my point is, I think from what we know, they've already said, we know the demand is this now. I mean, we are doing all the financials based on now because that's all we can do, right? And we understand that. So why, why can't we understand that this is the demand now? So we know what we're looking for. No project is perfect. I completely get that too. I'm not looking for perfect. I'm just looking to get, uh, the requirement if we can and if the land dedication and we we ask the affordable housing developers can this land support what we're aiming to get and if the answer is no we need to know that city council needs to know that if they're going to vote on whether or not this is an alternative mitigation of getting equal or greater value so i am very happy um, and i would be totally willing if most people want to go that direction to say Yes, let's get that information before council so council can make that decision and say to everybody, we're only going to get, you know, potentially the 328 units at one bedrooms and two bedrooms and studios. Um, if we want, you know, what the precise plan requires or asks for, which we're not getting, um, if we want to get the, the right proportion, then we're going to only get 298 units, and this is what we're voting on. But I think it would be helpful to know these things because I don't feel comfortable voting fully wholeheartedly yes on what we have now. So I would be in support of that. Um, and back to uh, the, the retail part portion. Yeah, with all those people, I agree. Definitely, if we can get all 50,000 square feet for neighborhood serving stuff, all for it. But because their program only looks at the 21 and then there's the five required by the city that does leave 24,000. And I, I don't want to be cynical, but I'm learning that it's necessary sometimes um, that sometimes things happen. And I know, again, it's not perfect, but that's a lot of affordable units. We're already struggling right now to get the required. Why am I, you know, why are we giving up almost 75 affordable units? If office goes in, we know office goes in quite readily over neighborhood retail. That's everybody has said that you guys have said that everybody knows that is just the case. So for the for that portion that is not in the program, if it is not neighborhood retail, which I'm hoping we get, but I understand it can't always be what I want um, and it goes to general office, we're losing out on a lot of affordable housing there also. So I just want to have plan C in place, let's say, in case that does happen? Uh, or can we talk about it with Google? At least put that out there. Let's have a discussion. Um, so those are the things I'm aiming for. If everyone is in agreement, that that sounds reasonable. Thanks. Um, Chair Cranston, can I uh, follow up? Yeah, because I, I have a question on that myself. So, um, so I wanted to just clarify a couple things. So. The requirement uh, for affordable housing is based on the 15% uh, of units. So the alternative mitigation for more has to be more than 15%. Um, so what was assessed in, in um, the report uh, produced what would essentially be a number that's around 17% um, with that 338 units. So it would be producing more units than what would minimally be required at the 15%. Um, the other thing I wanted to clarify is that the um, assumptions that SIFO Consulting used uh, in sort of modeling what could be developed on the site was assuming family mix. So it does assume more to, you know, larger bedroom uh, mix. So, um, so that 338 units really is translating into that family mix and the larger unit mix. Um, I think what 
um, the applicant was proposing as part of their market rate units, that is leaning more towards the smaller uh, studio or one bedroom based on market trends uh, for high density residential near transit. Um, but I just wanted to clarify that that's kind of what um, the basis of that CIFL consulting uh, report was really assuming. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, right. yeah, it would be great if the table was there for, you know, what is the mix they're assuming? How many units? And what is the demand? Um, what we're looking at? And then you can have like comparing apples to apples um, and have the council make a decision that way because um, I think it's less clear um, without it. Thank you. So I, I guess I, I would agree with that. I, I, so I, what you said, Lindsay, is what I had read was the city report says that the proposal actually does meet requirements of the precise, precise plan for the alternative indication. It, the precise plan, the, the precise plan does not require 380 units. Actually, lower than the 338. The 338 that the CFO calculated would, in fact, be more than what's required for the alternative mitigation, but it just doesn't have to be as high as Google and Lisa's calculation of what it could be. Correct? Yeah, so the 15% is based on the city's BMR requirements, not the precise plan right. requirements. So that um, assessment was based on those BMR requirements. Uh, and it does produce more based on what cycle came back with. And then second question, the retail space is only in buildings one and two, the R1 and R2. It's not in office buildings, is that correct? Correct, all of the ground floor commercial active use space are in residential buildings. There's one exception for the P2 parking structure. There's some ground floor retail shown. So the retail space is not in buildings that can be added or appended to office buildings. It's in spaces that are that have no other office space in those structures, correct? Correct. Okay. okay. But I just, I, I, it sounded like we were, I was worried that what Mr. Jin was suggesting was that it, things that were gonna be in office buildings could become part of office buildings, but it's actually, in the residential buildings at this space occurs. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, Commissioner Clark. Yeah, on that note, I think that makes it, um, I think that fact, like I was speaking to earlier, makes me feel like the, the risk there is pretty low. But, uh, but Vice Chair Yin's right, like anything can happen over time, and we're talking about a long time period. So I guess, um, and I guess, Lindsay, just to clarify, like maybe this isn't like truly written out somewhere, or maybe it is, but, but asking, Placing additional restrictions on that ground floor commercial space in those particular buildings would essentially that would be something that should be done through an amendment of the precise plan, right? It's it's not something that we could just sort of require on the spot, if I were guessing, but maybe maybe it is. Right? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, the precise plan allows these uses. So yeah, I think um, yeah, you know what what maybe a suggestion I would have is that, you know, I can definitely talk to the applicant uh, prior to going to council and seeing if they, uh, if there may be any interest to put any parameters around it, but um, ultimately what's allowed in the precise plan is something that would be allowed in the master plan. Got it. So um, if, if folks are amenable, um, let me let me do this. I'll, I'll go ahead and move the staff recommendation with, um, with just two points. Um, the first being, um, yes, Lindsay, I think maybe in the section where um, you do talk about that uh, in the staff report where you talk about the the ground floor commercial in those residential buildings, maybe just having a sentence in there that, that clearly states that, you know, the and, and that space uh, wasn't subject to the or isn't, you know, normally subject to um, the uh, the jobs housing linkage calculation just so if anyone has that same question, they understand that way. It's, it's just there, and they understand it. Um, and, um, instead of having to to go through the same discussion that we just had um, to try and figure it out. And you know, if they're if they decide as part of that that they want to revisit the the precise plan or the details of the precise plan later, they can. But at least they understand why that wasn't included in the jobs housing linkage. Um, and then the second piece would be. Um, Adding to the section where you're talking about the the um, 
the alternative mitigation for affordable housing, just including a little bit more detail, like the, the tables that folks talked about of the, the unit mixes. And it doesn't just have to be the one unit mix that um, our consultants did, but maybe um, maybe just some examples of if you do this mix, here's like the rough total that you would get to. Um, and then also, you probably already did, but just make it very clear, like uh, Chair Cranston just did that, you know, the the uh, the fifteen percent amount is 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 lower than um, basically what's being proposed in in either of those scenarios, um, if that's correct. Um, that way they can that way they can see you know several years from now if if we do end up with a um, with this parcel and we're um, you know you know going out with an RFP for affordable housing developers, um, we know roughly sort of what we could be looking at in terms of unit mixes and unit count and all those things. Mr. So, Chen, is that, are you seconding what he's putting out there? Uh, yeah, I was gonna say, uh, yeah, much appreciation for that. I, I do, I do second that. Um, I would also please ask that then in presentations here forward that, um, there's no statement that we're providing, you know, 20% affordable housing. Cause I think that sometimes, I think I heard that somewhere and um, I don't, I don't know where, maybe it's just been a long night, but that shouldn't be presented that we're hitting certain numbers when it's still in flux and we don't know. So maybe asking. Google to amend in addition would be nice. Thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Oh. And then I'll ask Christian to take a vote. Okay. Second. Um, so, Commissioner Clark, uh, oh. motion. Uh, Commissioner Clark. I, I do see Commissioner Haymeyer has her hand up before oh. I vote. Sorry. Yeah, I'm happy to second it if, if that's where we are. If there's oh. more discussion, I can. Oh. Oh. I think Vice Chair Haymeyer. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, Commissioner Clark. Commissioner Dempsey. I think you said aye. Yes. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Gutierrez. Aye. Commissioner Haymeyer. Aye. Commissioner Nunez? Aye. Vice Chair Yin? Aye. And Chair Cranston? Aye. And the motion carries unanimously. Right. Thank you, everyone. Um, that way we'll. And say, uh, Sandy, I'm, I'm assuming we're okay. We didn't have to read everything there because we said we're we're moving the staff okay, right? I think that's fine. You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna call me on these when we don't do that. So uh, item five is commission staff reports, updates, requests, and committee reports. Um, no action will be taken on any of the items at this time. Um, so any announcements, Sarah? Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, just a few things. Um, it was great to see everybody last week at the celebration of service. Um, much deserved for uh, all the advisory bodies to council, but in particular this body who works late on many weeks uh, and, and has a lot of very difficult stuff to cover. So again, appreciated by all um, to those of you who uh, couldn't make it. Um, certainly uh, you know, the, the whole city does appreciate of the work that you do. Um, on a sadder note, I'd like to announce that Stephanie Williams, our former zoning administrator, uh, planning manager, has left city. She's uh, gone on to work for the city of Los Altos. So um, for the time being, uh, Lindsay and I and Rebecca and Diana will step in variously to uh, each of her different roles, but we are looking for a replacement um, as quickly as we can. 
uh, update on city council. Um, they approved the 870 East El Camino Real project, which this body saw a few months ago. Uh, at this body's next meeting in early November, we are scheduled to review a 100% affordable housing project uh, near the corner of Montecito and Shoreline. So look forward to that. Uh, and then just an update about the housing element process. Uh, we did, uh, you know, a few months ago, we submitted our draft to HCD. Uh, we did receive our comment letter back. Uh, that comment letter is posted online. Uh, we are meeting with HCD to address those comments. And we're also meeting with different stakeholders uh, in order to tee up a full suite of options for um, the final a uh, housing element uh, for EPC and city council uh, deliberation. Um, the EPC is still tentatively scheduled to review the housing element in mid-November. Mr. Gutierrez? Yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge that I had attended the recognition of service and along with Chair Cranston and Vice Chair Yin and Chris Clark. So that was a uh, very interesting and uh, nice evening out. And I wanted to thank the chair for uh, doing the heavy lifting and presenting what uh, feats the EPC had done throughout the course of this last year. It was all Eric's work. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Any other announcements? Okay. And so the date of the next meeting, there it is. So uh, with that, we will adjourn the meeting at 10.39 p.m. Our next regularly scheduled meeting will be November 2nd, 2022. Thank you, everyone. Great evening.